Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Open, Open your, your eyes. eyes. Andre, don't you have an analysis to do? <laughs> okay. It was just a dream, just a dream. Th then Derek was here. It was like there's 10 hours of footage to analyze. And I didn't even know what he was talking about. All right, I'm just gonna go back to bed now. Back to bed like nothing ever happened. <gasps> oh. Andre, wake up. All right, all right, I'm up, Derek. Gosh, can't a man spend more than two months in analysis in peace? Ah. Oh. So needless to say, our analysis machine barely made it through all the footage of me three. Between trailers, treehouse streams, and random footage, there was over 10 hours to get through. And the poor analysis machine is running on fumes! But we're finally ready to present its findings. And as you might have guessed, there is a lot to go over. I mean, the moment you start pulling a one thread, five different Zelda sweaters start to unravel. Yeah, I don't get how that works either. So, over the course of what is by far our longest analysis ever, we'll explore the game's setting, the story, the characters, the enemies, the guardians, origin stories, the gameplay, various secrets, and everything else about the world, both inside and outside the plateau. And yet still tons and tons more somehow. And yes, we'll even touch on some timeline stuff too. So buckle up as we explore all the secrets, hidden meanings, and details that we found lurking in all the footage of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. So right off the bat, it's pretty clear that Zelda Breath of the Wild isn't your father's Legend of Zelda, in which Link explored a wide open world with little guidance. Outside of a few words imparted by an old man. Wait a second. Okay, so maybe Zelda Breath of the Wild owes just a little bit more to its predecessors than it might seem at first. But, it's this mixture of the old and the new that makes the game so damn interesting. As we can see elements from all over the Zelda timeline present here. Which also complicates things a bit when it comes to the timeline. And rest assured we'll have a lot more to say about that later in the video too. Now, despite Breath of the Wild's many departures from the series, the game actually opens up like most other Zelda games. With Link waking up. But this time, things are just a little different than before, and it raises all kinds of questions. And our first question involves that strange woman who urges Link awake by asking him to open his eyes. Open your eyes. A statement which, by the way, might be even more meaningful than it seems at first glance. So who is this mysterious woman? While it's impossible to say for sure, the incredibly obvious answer would be Zelda. Especially given the fact that she's awakened Link via telepathy before in A Link to the Past. We then see Link awaken in a bath of blue liquid a color which matches that of the blue energy seen throughout the world, and it impressively illuminates Link from below, casting a shadow on his chest, which is just the first of several neat lighting touches throughout the game. Now, once the blue liquid recedes, Link begins to emerge from his bath, and it reveals a symbol of the Sheikah people on the floor of the bath directly underneath. And given the fact that the Sheikah symbol is a tearful eye, it really makes Zelda's Open Your Eyes comment seem even more meaningful. Especially since Link will soon obtain the Sheikah Slate, which also has a Sheikah Eye symbol on it, and essentially acts as Link's third eye into the world with his map function and built-in telescope. Hmm, we're starting to notice a theme here. And speaking of the Sheikah, which I feel like is something I'll be saying a lot during this analysis, did you notice that Link's wearing boxer briefs when he first awakens? Yep, even Link appreciates the need for comfort and support while adventuring. But that's not all, because their style is remarkably similar to the outfit that Impa wore in Ocarina of Time. You remember Impa, right? Who happens to be a Sheikah? So what I'm getting at is that Link awakens in the Sheikah Shrine wearing what might be Sheikah clothes. So, either he's a Sheikah himself this time around, or he was directly involved with them before being placed here. And that leads us to our next question. What's Link doing here anyway? Now perhaps not surprisingly, but Nintendo's been suspiciously vague about this, and the only thing that we know for sure is that Link has been asleep for the past 100 years. At least according to the old man that he'll soon meet. And we do have to say that, for being over 100 years old, Link looks amazing for his age. Whatever Hylian moisturizer he's using really must be something else. But that only further raises the question of why Link was sleeping here in the first place. Could it be something similar to Ocarina of Time, where Link was too young to be the hero and was put to sleep until he came of age? Maybe, but probably unlikely given the fact that Link visibly aged all seven years in that case, whereas he very clearly hasn't aged anywhere close to 100 years this time around. And because Link hasn't visibly aged, it seems that calling it sleep might be a bit of a misnomer, when instead it appears to be closer to cryostasis, which makes sense given the apparent technology seen in this room. Hell, the domed portion above the bath seems like it might perfectly fit over the lower section, like a cap. It almost looks like something straight out of Star Wars. So, perhaps Link was fully sealed within the rejuvenation pod before it opened, thus beginning the wake-up sequence. Based on this, it seems possible that Link was put to sleep with the knowledge that he would be needed at some point in the future. After all, we'll soon learn from the old man that Calamity Ganon appeared suddenly 100 years ago, before being locked away. That can't just be coincidence, right? But we'll have much more on Ganon later. 
Now interestingly, the setup is extremely similar to Crystallis on the NES, which also began with a hero reawakening 100 years later, following a major world-threatening event, in a day and age where technology's been largely abandoned. Oh, and he even emerges from a cave too. Now, it probably is just a coincidence as that game was developed by SNK, although there was a Game Boy Color remake which was in fact developed and published by Nintendo. Anyways, building on all of this so far is our final idea. Maybe Link wasn't really sleeping at all. Or rather, not just sleeping. I mean, the room he awakens in is called the Shrine of Resurrection. Emphasis on resurrection. So maybe 100 years ago, Link was either wounded or perhaps even dead, and that he was brought here to be healed or resurrected, which evidently is a process that might take some time. The imagery here certainly plays into this idea, with Link walking down a canal toward the light of the outside world, as if he's being reborn. And given that the blue energy seems to be what brings life to the machines and electronics in this world, it might just have been what gave life to Link too. And we have another wild idea related to that. Because that blue color can be found all over Link himself. Both his earrings and hairband are blue, and even his eyes too. Now look, it's probably just a coincidence too, or at the least, an intentional part of the art design. But what if it hints at a deeper connection that Link has with this technology beyond just the present circumstances? Could there possibly be a technology-related component to Link himself? It would explain the rather digital-looking manner in which it gets torn apart while warping between locations. But again, it probably is just the art style. And on the subject of the art style, there are a few common visual elements linking pretty much all the technology together. Of course, there's a blue energy that powers them, but another common trait includes the lighted circles connected by lines, which can be seen on podiums, towers, and shrine walls, including this one. It's a cool, distinctive design, which also, fittingly enough, might be based on real-life computer chips. See? Yeah, it's pretty clear that we're not dealing with your typical Indiana Jones temple technology here. We're talking actual computers this time around. Now interestingly, Zelda's newfound emphasis on technology may not actually be quite as new as it seems. Okay, so we've already pointed out that Breath of the Wild's open-endedness is similar to the original Legend of Zelda on the NES. But as it turns out, the technology angle has roots in that game too. Because, according to an interview the French publication Game Cult had with Shigeru Miyamoto back in 2012, the original idea for The Legend of Zelda wasn't based on fantasy at all. Instead, it was rooted in technology and sci-fi, with the Triforce pieces actually being computer chips that Link had to reunite instead. I guess you could say it's an interesting... Link? At any rate, the technology angle was made apparent right from the get-go, from the machine that Link awakens in, to the fact that the entire cave here appears to be artificial, given that Link's footsteps have a metallic twang to them, which of course falls right in line with the other shrines we see elsewhere in the game. Although this shrine is distinct from the others in that the entrance is a mere cave opening, albeit one that still looks artificial, as opposed to the more elaborate entrances of the other shrines. Then there's also the fact that the walls here are lined with orange and blue lights, instead of the usual torches. And of course, there's a nearby podium lit in blue that awards Link the Sheikah Slate, which is basically Hyrule's version of an iPad. Get it? iPad? Now, the game describes the Sheikah Slate as a device that you've never seen before, yet there's something oddly familiar about it. Now, if we take that statement at face value, then while Link may not have seen the slate itself before, it could still mean that he's somewhat familiar with the technology in general. Or it might mean that Link only thinks he hasn't seen it before, but he actually has, which could be owed to the fact that he might have amnesia. It would explain why Link appears to be unfamiliar with this world, at least going off the words of the old man who we'll soon meet. Or maybe it's just Nintendo's sly way of breaking the fourth wall, referencing the fact that it resembles a real-life gamepad controller, which would indeed make it familiar to you, the player. But the Sheikah Slate is much more than just a navigational device, as it's also how Link will interface with other technology of this world. We actually see it in action mere moments later when Link holds it up to a second podium in order to authenticate it, thereby opening a door to the outside. That's right, authentication. It seems like Hyrule technology might be following Apple's closed ecosystem approach. I guess we won't be buying any knockoff Sheikah Slates. And did you notice that the podium, like other technology that Link can interact with, was lit with amber-colored lights before turning blue after being activated, as if they were in a power-down, sleep-mode state? Anyways, after exiting the room he woke up in, Link finds a pair of chests that contain an old shirt and well-worn pants. Now, seeing as these are the very articles of Link lacks, as well as the fact that both items are described as old, these might just be the very clothes that Link had on him when he was first brought to this shrine. However, both are described as being a bit too short, which instead suggests that they aren't actually Link's, and that they may have been placed here by someone else for him to discover when he wakes up. But perhaps it's possible that Link actually did age and grow slightly during his long slumber. It's also worth mentioning that in Skyward Sword, the robot, Scrapper, did refer to Link as Master Short Pants. So it's not like ill-fitting clothing is anything new for Link, even if the situation isn't quite the same. So all of this raises our third question, how did Link end up here anyway? Again, it's impossible to say for sure right now, but we do have one prime suspect. The Old Man. 
After all, who's standing at attention facing directly toward Link the moment he exits the cave? The old man. It's as if he's been expecting Link all this time. Why else would he have set up camp nearby? It's not like there's much else of interest going on around here. And not only is he visibly old, but the game even describes him as old in the same manner it did the clothing. Just to really drive that point home that this dude is old. So could he be the one that put Link in the resurrection chamber? And subsequently, the one who placed the clothes there for him to find? And maybe he's been watching over him all this time. If the answer is yes, it would mean that he's well north of 100 years old himself. Which seems pretty elderly even by Zelda standards. Unless he's a Sheikah. After all, Impa, who's most definitely a Sheikah, survived for hundreds of years while waiting for Link's return in Skyward Sword. The old man also admits that he's lived alone here for quite some time, and that he can't imagine that their meeting is a simple coincidence. Somehow we're thinking the old man knows a little bit more than he's letting on. Tell us what you know, old man! Despite his curious coyness, he does provide us with the first concrete details about this world, specifying that the immediate area is called the Grey Plateau, and that it's a birthplace of the entire kingdom of Hyrule. He then points to the Temple of Time and specifies that it used to be the site of many sacred ceremonies, but then elaborates that since the decline of the kingdom, it now sits abandoned in a state of decay. Now before we continue, he actually drops some pretty important information there, if indirectly, because there's a good reason the plateau is known as the birthplace of Hyrule, and it's all due to the Temple of Time. And yes, we know that is in fact the Temple of Time because its name is displayed on screen when Link approaches. Now, as you might recall from Skyward Sword, that game took place in a world before Hyrule, back when it was known as just the surface. Which of course confirms that this game takes place AFTER Skyward Sword. Now during the course of Skyward Sword, Skylost Isle of the Goddess, which contained the statue of the goddess Hylia, returns to the ground at the site of the Sealed Grounds. The book, Hyrule Astoria, then elaborates that the ancient sage, Raru, built the Temple of Time OVER the Sealed Grounds, as in right here, presumably. And sure enough, if Link explores the Temple of Time in Breath of the Wild, he'll find a statue of the goddess in the back. No, this one's just a wee bit smaller than the one of Skyward Sword. And then there are the even smaller ones surrounding it. But it cements the connection that this is likely the same Temple of Time as the one seen in Ocarina of Time and Twilight Princess. And speaking of the statue, we also know they can interact with it and pray to the goddess. Although nothing much happens, as only a message appears saying the goddess smiles upon you. However, in a short gameplay sequence released by Nintendo recently on Facebook, we can see the statue of the goddess will actually glow at some point which likely indicates that something important will happen when you interact with it at that time. We're just not sure what or what caused it to start glowing. Finally, the Temple of Time is hiding at least one more secret, because you might have heard the piano keys that play softly in the background. But they're not just random notes. Instead, if you speed it up, you might just hear something a little familiar. Yep, that was a song of time, at least in part. Pretty cool, right? And that's, of course, the same song that played inside the Temple of Time in Ocarina of Time. Anyways, back to the old man, as he refers to the Temple of Time as yet another forgotten entity, a mere ghost of its former self, which is an interesting statement given that it's literally the only structure he talks about, despite the implication that there's more than one. Now the immediate interpretation is that he's speaking in a general sense, that is just one of many forgotten structures. After all, we can see plenty of evidence of this in the demo, with other structures in various states of disrepair. But what if he's hinting at something else? Perhaps something a little bit more introspective, like himself. He does refer to it as an entity, after all, instead of just building or structure. And he did state earlier that he's been living alone, as in perhaps forgotten, like the Temple of Time, and is now just a ghost of his former greatness. Using this interpretation, he may play a larger role in the story than just as a mere guide. Which does make sense, especially if he is indeed a Sheikah. It all would certainly help explain why he knew when Link would awaken, and how he knows so much about him. Regardless, once you're done talking with the old man, you're free to explore. But there is at least one more objective that's heavily suggested that Link do, and he'll be continually reminded of it by the mysterious woman until he does, and that's to follow the mark under Sheikah Slate's map. But that's for a good reason, because once there, you'll find another pedestal that you can activate with the Slate, and this one, in turn, activates the Sheikah Towers, which are also clearly marked with the Sheikah symbol. A cutscene then starts, showing one rising in Link's current location, followed by several others around the world. But what's the point of these towers? Well, in the specific one's case, climbing to the top allows Link to access a terminal that will download a full map of the local region directly to his Slate. 
and presumably the other towers would do the same thing for their respective regions. Which of course suggests that there's only one tower per region. But you know what they say about assumptions, right? So we actually spent hours mapping out the locations of every tower we can see in the world. Which was a giant pain in the ass by the way. And it backs it up, there is one tower per region. But that can't be all the towers are good for, right? I mean, those towers seem to be a little bit too extravagant to serve as just glorified map kiosks, don't you think? Okay, now of course, from a gameplay perspective, the towers actually serve multiple purposes. For one, you can easily see them from afar as they act as weenies to draw you to each region. Kind of like the castle in Disneyland. Especially since it's easy to see which towers you have or haven't yet visited, being lit in either red or blue respectively. And then, once you gain access to the paraglider, those towers will probably come in useful as launching off points to reach other areas of the world. Especially since Link can instantly teleport to any tower he's activated, which he can do with the shrines too. So that's all well and good so far, but we think there still might be even more to them. For instance, we notice that after the tower rises, the final step in its activation involves these three metallic beams flipping upwards before locking in place, with an audible thunk. And it's only then that the tower turns blue, indicating its active status. And sure enough, if we take a look at the other towers in the distance, they have those same metallic structures, only in a lowered position since they haven't yet been activated. And we have a feeling those three metallic beams are for more than just decoration. Instead, we think they may be antennas, thereby making the entire tower more of a radio tower. So maybe the towers can communicate with each other, or perhaps to something else. Now, there's a lot more that happens at this point than just the rising towers. Because immediately after, Link hears the mysterious woman again, this time asking him to remember, before reminding him that he's been asleep for a hundred years. This both reinforces the idea that Link has no memory from before his sleep, but also that whatever happened to him back in the day was probably of some significance. After all, why else would the woman want him to remember it? She then draws his attention to a distant castle, where we can see a dark energy begin to take shape around it, which she refers to as the Beast. And although she's a bit light on the details, we'll quickly learn a bit more from the old man who appears the moment that Link descends the tower, who clarifies that that is in fact Hyrule Castle, and that the Beast is known as the Calamity Ganon. And we can quickly see the dark energy actually take his pig-like shape, with two glowing eyes, a pair of horns, and what appears to be his mouth opening and closing. The old man goes on to explain that Ganon appeared suddenly 100 years ago, destroying everything in its path and leaving the Kingdom of Hyrule in a state of ruin, which explains the Calamity moniker since the word Calamity refers to an event causing great and often sudden damage or distress. The old man continues that Hyrule Castle has just barely been able to contain the evil, and that it won't be able to hold out for much longer given the Ganon's increasing its strength until the moment it will unleash its blight upon the land once again, and that moment is apparently fast approaching. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here. For one, up until this very moment, there was no visible dark energy surrounding the castle at all. Look, there's nothing there when Link exits the cave. And now there is. So was Ganon just biding his time until this very moment? I guess he really does a habit of making sudden appearances, doesn't he? Although in this case, his appearance immediately followed the rise of the towers. Now this could just be a contrivance for the sake of the story, but maybe they truly are connected in some way. This tower is called the Resurrection Tower after all. Maybe Link's not the only one being resurrected here. Although, that title could just be referring to the fact that enabling this tower is what brought the others to life as well. So it likely is just a coincidence, especially given the fact that the old man doesn't seem terribly surprised by Ganon's appearance here. Next, we know that Ganon is currently being contained by Hyrule Castle, which the old man refers to as the kingdom's purest symbol. But how is it containing him? Well, just before Ganon appears, we can see a bright light shining from the castle's tower. Is this a symbol of Hyrule Castle's purity? And related to that, could it be Princess Zelda herself, or a representation thereof, who of course is the incarnation of the goddess Hylia? The light's appearance does coincide perfectly with a mysterious voice, who again is probably Zelda, and it similarly fades away just as soon as she's done talking. Zelda and Light do kind of go hand in hand after all, such as how she gives Link Light arrows in Ocarina of Time, which are essential in taking Ganon down. Regardless of whether Zelda's involved here or not, we have a sneaking suspicion that something else might be, as in those four tilted pillars sticking out of the ground just outside Hyrule Castle. After all, we can see they share the circular marks of similar technology that we've already talked about. Perhaps those pillars are what's keeping him in check until he grows strong enough to overpower them completely. Regardless of their exact purpose, the fact that there's four of them might be hinting at something else too. And that's the fact that they might be tied into the game's dungeons, of which we've heard from a reliable source that there's four of them, making for one per pillar. So maybe Link needs to visit those dungeons in order to restore power to the pillars, thereby keeping Ganon in check. Okay, so we've talked about the towers, Calamity Ganon, and also Hyrule Castle. And yet, there's still more about this cutscene that we haven't touched on yet. Because after all of that, the camera zooms out providing an awesome view of the plateau itself. And we finally get a good sense of just how high up this plateau really is. Almost as if it were a grounded version of Skyloft. 
Which does kind of make sense thematically, seeing as how part of Skyloft now makes up this land, as we said earlier. And we're pretty sure this is all by design. After all, from this vantage point, we can see that a massive stone wall runs around much of the plateau's perimeter, and it stretches all the way to the ground. And that wall wraps around much of the plateau, with only a few gaps mostly due to age, which you can easily see by running along the edge of the plateau yourself. But why is that wall there anyway? From a gameplay perspective, the answer is simple. Since Link can't grab on to climb down it, it prevents him from leaving the plateau until he gets a paraglider. But it's the story perspective that has us much more interested. Because the fact that there's a wall there at all suggests that the plateau separation from the rest of the world isn't entirely natural, or really natural at all. The wall is obviously man-made after all, and it seems unlikely it was constructed around the plateau's natural exterior, as that would imply that the plateau naturally had sheer cliffs before. So does this mean the land around it was dug up to remove what might have been a more gradual slope to the rest of the world? This certainly seems like the most plausible option, but then again, this is a world of some pretty impressive technology. So what if we think a little bit more outside the box? As in, we wouldn't rule out the possibility of this entire section being artificially raised from below. After all, we already know that the Sheikahs had no problem building elaborate shrines underground, as well as towers that can mysteriously rise up from underground. So what if those walls are actually just the outer rim of a giant raised platform that sits beneath the plateau? And if that's the case, which realistically it probably isn't, we can't help but wonder the entire plateau might be able to rise or lower later in the game. Okay, yeah, it's a pretty wild idea, we'll admit, but you never know. Now, we should also mention that, for as unnatural as the wall itself is, the topographical outline of the plateau, as revealed on the map, doesn't seem particularly artificial. So, maybe the walls are constructed simply to prevent erosion or something? There's really any number of ideas, and there's clearly more to the story here. So, taken all together, it seems that the moniker of the isolated plateau is no accident. But why? Were the builders trying to keep something out? Perhaps to protect a sleeping Link from an outside danger, like Ganon? Or in another wild idea, maybe it was done in preparation of a Great Flood, to keep the area safe from the rising waters. Okay, yeah, it's probably unlikely given other things we'll explore about the timeline later. But then again, it is Zelda, where anything's possible. Except for making their original release date. Zing! Anyways, after all of this, the old man then draws Link's attention to a nearby shrine, which is just one more than 100 in the game, according to Nintendo. And we ourselves have heard that the final number is somewhere between that and 130. Now according to the old man, the shrine lit up the moment that the towers rose from the ground. And we can see proof of that in this video from before the towers were activated, where we can see an unlit shrine in the distance. Which shows that they're completely inaccessible until you activate the tower here. But here's a question, does this tower only activate the shrines in the same region, or every shrine around the world? Well, we think we have our answer, since we can see other shrines in the background lit in red, while their respective nearby towers aren't yet activated. So it would appear that this first tower is the one that activates them all. And maybe that's what the antenna is for, as in it wirelessly activated the shrines. Regardless, the shrine is predictably lit up in red, just like the other technology that's yet to be fully activated by Link. So in order to gain access, Link will have to use a Sheikah Slate at the podium just outside to activate the lift, which will then turn the shrine blue, again indicating it's been activated like everything else. Which also makes it easy to see at a glance which shrines Link has or hasn't already visited, just like with the towers. And this is especially useful because it seems you can visit the shrines in whichever order you want, including the four in the plateau here. Now, after riding the lift down at any of the plateau's four shrines, Link will find a podium at the start of each one they can hold a Sheikah Slate to in order to download additional abilities called runes. And these runes include the powers of Magnesis, Cryonis, Stasis, and Remote Bombs. But we'll talk more about them later. And like the map regions, the information for the runes is downloaded to the Sheikah Slate via a droplet of water. Yeah, it's a neat effect, but there's just a little bit more to it than just looking cool. Because, you might have noticed the Sheikah symbol on the stalactite just above, but it's only the top half of the icon, as it's missing the teardrop portion. That is until the droplet forms, which represents the teardrop, which itself is made up of the information flowing down to it, and thereby completing the symbol. But the teardrop only lingers for a second or two before dropping, which is also symbolic of the passing of knowledge from the Sheikah to Link. It's some pretty neat stuff. At any rate, the shrines in the plateau basically act as a tutorial for each of those runes. Now, if any of this sounds familiar, yeah, shrines are basically mini dungeons, in that they contain a series of puzzles or obstacles for Link to get through. And some of those puzzles are even optional, because Nintendo told us that they'll often contain an out-of-the-way chest that you'll then have to figure out how to get, but the goods inside should make it worth your while. Now, as we mentioned before, Nintendo has made it clear that the shrines aren't replacements for the dungeons, which makes sense given that dungeons usually take at least an hour to get through, whereas the shrines we've seen so far only take about 5-10 to 10 minutes on average. 
Although Nintendo has also stated that some shrines will be longer. Now, I realize it may not sound like much, but consider this. If we calculate the total time for the shrines using even the most conservative figures, as in 5 minutes each for 100 shrines, that still comes out to over 8 hours of gameplay for just the shrines alone. And if we assume that even half of those are actually 10 minutes in length, then we're looking at over 12 hours. Yeah, it's kinda nuts. And again, that's on the very conservative end. Now, although the exact contents and layout of each shrine obviously differ, they do seem to be very similar in structure and appearance. After all, they all seem to be accessed via this distinctive looking structure above ground, which leads into the shrine itself deep underground. And these shrines are all built out of shiny metallic material that Link is unable to climb, which requires that he uses his brains instead of his brawn to get around. So it's pretty dang obvious that there's nothing natural about these shrines, just like with the Shrine of Resurrection where Link awoke and the towers have popped out of the ground. Heck, even the single type of enemy that we see here, being mini guardians, are obviously mechanical in nature, which makes sense given the common theme of all this being Sheikah technology, at least based on their symbol being found everywhere. But as artificial as these shrines may be, they're not completely devoid of life. Well, sort of. Because, it seems you'll always find a monk at the end waiting inside a shrine of his own, who even introduce themselves as humble monks. But, they're protected by a barrier made of energy, which Link is able to dispense with simply by touching it. Perhaps this too is because of the Sheikah Slate? Although the Slate itself doesn't seem to react at all, which might tie back into our theory of Link himself having a technology angle to him. After all, we can't imagine that just anyone could break through that barrier, because what would be the point of a barrier then? So something has to be triggering it. We're just not sure what. Now each of those monks actually has their own name, which is what the shrine is also named after. And the first shrine here that the old man points to is called Oman O. But there's something pretty clever about that name. Because if you rearrange the letters, it actually says Aonuma, as in E.G. Aonuma, the game's director. So we have a feeling that the other shrines, with similarly peculiar names, might be following suit, featuring the rearranged letters of people from the development staff. So that's pretty cool that they make an in-game cameo of sorts. Although, there is a certain irony in using monks as one's in-game representation when they also profess to being humble. Anyways, even though the monks all have different names, they all look remarkably similar, with an elderly body type and a Sheikah symbol on their head. Which we're guessing probably means they're Sheikah too. I know, I know, it's that level of insight that only the analysis machine can provide. But even ignoring that symbol, their body type and pose is extremely similar to Old Impa in Skyward Sword, who again is a Sheikah. And to back all of this up, even the old man tells you that something of the Sheikah might still remain hidden away in a shrine such as this, perhaps in reference to those very same monks. Oh, and that Sheikah symbol is also likely symbolic of the third eye that's historically been represented as being on the forehead, which is of course a concept that suggests a level of perception beyond ordinary sight, which is something the monks appear to have given that they can communicate with Link the moment he enters the shrine. Heck, the monks even say themselves that they've been blessed with the sight of the goddess Hylia and they continue that they're dedicated to helping those who seek to defeat Ganon, and that with Link's arrival, their duty is now fulfilled. And finally, they award Link a spirit orb for finding them, before evaporating into some kind of magical dust. But what are those spirit orbs for anyway? Well, the old man does promise Link that if he finds a treasure within four of the plateau shrines, he'll give Link a paraglider. Sweet! And by treasure, we're reasonably confident he means the spirit orbs. But what about all the other shrines and their spirit orbs? After all, we know from Treehouse Live that the monks outside of the plateau still award spirit orbs too, and Nintendo has even said that the orbs will serve another or different purpose in the final game. So we have a couple of ideas of what that could be. For one, we think the paraglider might be a clue. After all, it seems to be Link's ticket off of the plateau, making the four orbs here essentially act as a gate to further progression in the game. So maybe the rest of the orbs serve a similar purpose, say by preventing access to dungeons until you have a certain amount. Kind of like Star Doors in Mario. But then again, the game's director has also suggested that you'll be able to fight Ganon, if you so choose, surprisingly early into the game, perhaps indicating there won't be any gates like this. So we have another idea. Seeing as the spirit orbs are all absorbed into Link's body, as in they're literally internalized, we think they may be used to upgrade something about himself, such as his stamina, heart meter, or maybe even rune abilities. After all, Nintendo did confirm to us at E3 that you'd be able to upgrade Link's abilities in some way. They just didn't tell us how. Now, even though all the monks might look the same at first, there are actually some very subtle differences between all six of the ones we've seen so far. Take the four in the plateau, for example. Even though they're all dressed the same, they also all have a slightly different pose, with their hands outstretched in varying ways. And though the two monks in the shrines outside of the plateau share the same poses, they're augmented visually with a cloth over their face, and one of them is made even more distinct with a circular decoration behind them. So it appears that every monk will be unique beyond just their name. 
but we also wonder if monks in similar regions will have similar traits, such as how the four in the plateau all have the same physical appearance with only the pose changing, while the two we've seen outside the plateau share the face cloth. Could they both be from the same region, maybe? Now, while the monks have a physical presence and clearly communicate with Link, there's something odd about them. Their mouths don't move when they talk. In fact, they don't move at all. Not even a little bit. Not even to breathe. So we think it's pretty clear that they exist in a more spiritual sense than the actual physical one. Oh yeah, then there's the fact that they just disintegrate into a green mist, which stands in stark contrast to the blue energy seen elsewhere in the game, which really does suggest as more spiritual, or magical at the least, as opposed to being technology-based. Now all of this raises the question as to the exact purpose of these shrines. Were they built just to protect the monks? Perhaps until the arrival of a hero like Link? It's impossible to say, although we do have another idea, and it might just involve the towers too. Okay, so we've already pointed out the various lighted circles connected by lines before, and we can see them plastered all over the walls of the shrines, as well as the sides of the towers. But we wonder if there might be even more to them than what we've already suggested, because those circles and lines are also commonly used to represent computer networks. So could all of these shrines and towers perhaps be linked to one giant network, like a Hylian internet? Both the towers and shrines do seem to put an emphasis on the passing of knowledge after all, much like the very internet you are on right now. So, will something happen when you activate them all and complete the network? And could they perhaps be tied to those four pillars outside Hyrule Castle as well? And speaking of connections, after you finish your first shrine, the old man mysteriously appears once again, where he explains that the towers and shrines are all connected to the Sheikah Slate, which in turn is connected to the Sheikah people, who he says used to inhabit these lands and protect it using their power and wisdom. But hold up, power and wisdom, huh? Why does that sound so familiar? Oh right, because of the Triforce, which is made up of three parts, being the Triforce of Power, the Triforce of Wisdom, and the Triforce of Courage. And it's that last word, being Courage, that's missing from the Power and Wisdom the old man just mentioned. So we can't help but wonder, that missing word might be symbolic of how Link fits into all of this, as he's historically been the human embodiment of the Triforce of Courage. So, could the fact that he might be the missing piece of the Sheikah people perhaps also support the idea that he might be a Sheikah himself? At any rate, wisdom and power will only get you so far when protecting the world, and we think that just might be where the Guardians come into play. You know, those giant squid-like mechanical creatures that we first saw way back in the original E3 2014 trailer? Now, originally, we were going to put these guys in the enemy section, but here's the thing. Even though they attack Link, they're not really enemies, from a certain point of view. Because, unlike all of the other enemies we've seen so far, these guys are mechanical, with springs and bolts flying out of them when destroyed. And they also seem to be powered by the same blue energy we've seen elsewhere. And then there's a the fact that they even share the same distinctive design patterns as other Sheikah-related objects, like the shrines, towers, and even Link's Sheikah Slate. Which is to say that the Guardians aren't just man-made, but probably Sheikah-made, as with seemingly everything else technology-related so far. And this is further backed up by the fact that the Mini Guardians, which adorably only have three legs instead of six, are the only enemies we've seen appear inside shrines. Which makes sense, seeing as everything inside them appears to be artificial and deliberately placed. Oh, and speaking of shrines, their entrances even share a similar shape with that of the Guardians' heads, complete with similar rings on the side. And we can see a similar motif reflected inside the shrines too, including on top of the lift that Link rides down, as well as above the monks. Yep, the Sheikahs sure were consistent with their designs. And actually, those designs appear to be based on something in the real world, as suggested to us by one of our fans on Twitter, at Weimaguti. Does this look familiar? It's an example of ancient Japanese pottery, and if we turn it upside down, we can see it not only shares the same basic shape as the Guardian, but also the circular details as well. Neat! Anyways, given the fact that they're called Guardians, they're pretty clearly designed to guard something. But what? Well, we're not entirely sure, but the E3 demo may offer a clue. Because, as you probably know, there were quite a few Guardians to be found around the plateau. Except all of them are in various states of apparent disrepair, almost like they were frozen in time. And we think they may tell a story. Because, almost all of the Guardians in the plateau appear to have congregated in the same general location, right outside the Temple of Time and the nearby ruins. It might mean that they were trying to defend the temple and the nearby structures from attack. It would also explain why the Temple of Time isn't just in a state of decay, but has pretty clearly sustained some massive damage. So it would seem that some kind of battle took place here. Now beyond the Temple of Time, there is one more Guardian that can be found in the plateau along the mountain river. But it too is near a heavily damaged building, suggesting it may have also been trying to defend it. It almost makes you feel bad for the poor guys. And in this year's E3 trailer, we can see another area full of Guardian corpses. Almost like a Guardian graveyard. But why are they here? It's probably a safe bet that something important happened here too, we're just not sure what. Now, even though most of the Guardians have clearly seen better days, there are a few exceptions, such as this one in the plateau that awakens when Link gets close. 
and you can even see some rubble fall off of it as it comes back to life, suggesting it's been quite some time since it's been active. Maybe for the first time since the attack. But once awakened, it's a force to be reckoned with, as it will attempt to lock on the Link with a laser sight from its eyeball. And if it maintains that lock for more than a few seconds without Link finding cover, it'll open fire, and those blast do a massive amount of damage. In fact, it's strong enough to even blow apart the nearby wall here, which helpfully gives Link easy access to the shrine just beyond it. See, Guardians aren't always so bad. Now, not only are their blasts strong, but they have an insane range too. In this video from IGN, we can see the Guardian is still able to target Link even after he runs up the hill a fair distance away. Now, if you think the Guardians are intimidating when stationary, what about when they aren't stuck in place? Well, Nintendo Treehouse Live revealed a short video of one that's alive and well, chasing Link around while he fights back from horseback. And it's here that we can see just how frightening the Guardians can really be. Because for one, they're capable of moving and aiming their head independently. Two, they're fast, as the one here has little trouble keeping up with Link even while on horseback, which is something we saw before back in the E3 2014 trailer, with a Guardian hot on Link's and his horse's tail. Yeah, it seems like the Guardians won't give up easily. And it doesn't help that the music that plays during a Guardian encounter barely even qualifies as music. Instead, it sounds more chaotic in nature, which is perhaps a hint as to the unpredictability of Guardian battles. And we can only imagine how frightening it must be to try and take on one without the aid of your horse. Or maybe we don't have to imagine it at all. Because we can see Link doing exactly that in the E3 trailer, as he hides behind a pair of disabled Guardians while a third appears to be looking for him. And based on the intensity of this scene, what with all that smoke and fire, we're guessing this is a pretty major battle. I mean, the Guardian on the right doesn't even have its head. And those Guardians do appear to be fresh kills. The one on the left is still sparking after all, and we can even see a glowing blue component at its base, as well as another on top of the fallen Guardian to the right, which stands in stark contrast to the unpowered Guardians we've seen elsewhere. So does this mean that Link may have to battle three or more Guardians at this point? It's possible, but seeing as this appears to be an in-game cutscene as opposed to a dramatized gameplay moment, it might mean that something else took them out, and Link just happened upon the scene, especially because that third Guardian may not actually be looking for Link. Instead, it appears to be looking past him, just before it gets ready to fire its laser beam, which suggests that it has something else in its sights. So this could mean that there's another threat they're defending against. We just wonder what it could be. Regardless, the scene also makes us wonder if stealth might play a role in some of the Guardian encounters. Especially given the fact that in the E3 demo, they're the only enemy that appears on the radar, as a glowing dot that pulsates when they're tracking you, but only when they're active. Or, at the very least, it should be a huge help in trying to escape them. Although even that may be tricky given not only how fast they are, but how dexterous their tentacles make them, such as how the one here is able to clamber over his fallen brothers, which might suggest that small structures, like walls, may barely even register as a hurdle to them. Also, in a neat touch, did you notice how the Guardians is stepping on shift under its weight? That's pretty cool. Now, even though the Guardians are strong, they're not invincible, although it might seem like it given that they have a ridiculous 500 HP going by the one in the plateau. So how do you fight back? Well, very carefully. <laughs> okay, well, as you may have guessed or even seen, its giant glowing blue eye is key, and it seems a bullseye from your bow will inflict a fair amount of damage. But we also know that it's weak to explosives too, and each time you land a hit, its head will recoil and rotate slightly, thus breaking its lock on Link, buying him a precious few seconds to ready another shot or find cover. Furthermore, going by the field encounter, it looks like repeated hits with bomb arrows can knock them off balance too, which appears to be what gives Link the chance to truly fight back and land a direct shot when it's stationary, which also just so happens to be the finishing blow. But, was the Guardian just low on energy, or is the fact that Link switched to an arrow made of energy what finished him off? We're thinking it's the latter, especially because it's the same arrow we saw Link using against the Guardian back in the original reveal trailer. So, we have a feeling these energized arrows are especially powerful against the Guardians. Maybe all that extra energy overloads their circuits or something. At any rate, when Link finally does defeat a Guardian, they explode in the most spectacular manner, flinging all kinds of mechanical components everywhere. But while most of them instantly disappear, we can see a few remain on the ground. Could these be materials that Link can collect? It would seem so, given that we can see one of those pieces starts to glimmer just before the video ends, just like other collectibles. And then there's the fact that the mini guardians similarly drop ancient screws and ancient springs that Link can pick up. But what can Link do with these components? I mean, they're not food, so can Link maybe use them in contraptions of his own? Or maybe he can just sell them for money? Okay, so we've clearly seen a lot of dead guardians, but what took them out? Well, the obvious answer would be Ganon, when he attacked 100 years ago, sending the world into a state of ruin. But, the fact that most of the Guardians seem to be mostly intact suggests that something may have deactivated them remotely. But what about the ones that survived and are still active? Why were they spared when some of their brethren were not? Well, maybe they weren't spared at all. 
Instead, whether they've merely been reactivated or resurrected, if you will. Perhaps by Ganon. Again, it might explain their purple color, which as we touched on earlier, matches that of Ganon. Especially because purple doesn't appear to be the Guardian's natural color. At least based on the mini Guardians, which are red instead. And we're guessing the mini ones are protected by the shrines to avoid being taken over. And finally, there's a fact that the Guardian in the field here doesn't appear to care at all about the nearby Bokoblins and appears to be focusing solely on Link. One might think that something called a Guardian would be a little bit less discriminating if their purpose is to truly defend something. So if we're onto something here, with the Guardians being either possessed or corrupted, we wonder if there might be a way for Link to restore them to their normal selves. Okay, so by now, it should be pretty clear that Breath of the Wild isn't your typical Zelda game. Even the game's title strays from convention. I mean, instead of being named after a major item or character, it instead evokes an experience. One that's rooted in nature and survival. Even the game's logo represents this idea, featuring a simpler, more rustic appearance, with flat colors and is visibly aged, with imperfections all throughout. Even the Master's Sword, which has historically been portrayed as flawless, is rusted and worn down, which is clearly symbolic of the ruined state of the world. And at the end of the trailer, we can see a flower sprout up from the logo, perhaps a sign as to how the world's being slowly reclaimed by nature. And the entire game is built around this wild idea, featuring a giant world that Link can explore almost entirely seamlessly. And Nintendo really seems to be taking that seamless angle to heart, such as how when Link exits a shrine when he awakens for the first time, the game transitions from gameplay to a cutscene without any hard cuts at all. It's a subtle effect, but one that further lends to the immersion that the developers are aiming for, which is a world and experience without seams or boundaries. Now that cutscene shows Link looking out upon a vast landscape, which as Nintendo themselves pointed out during the Treehouse stream, is reminiscent of this artwork for the original Legend of Zelda, including how the Parrot Mountains here are the same shape as those in the original artwork. And that's obviously by design, as this world is meant to evoke the feeling similar to those people experienced when playing the original game for the first time. Which is to say, throwing you right into the world with level direction, where exploring and figuring things out for yourself is paramount. And that's pretty much the case here too, mostly. Because, although you are entirely free to explore and tackle things in most any order, the game actually does provide some light guidance. In fact, our analysis up to this point has been mostly built around that exact series of events. So to recap, Link wakes up, follows directions to the tower, where after raising it, the old man will point you toward the first of four shrines, and after you visit all four, he promises to give you a paraglider, which then allows you to escape the confines of the plateau and explore the rest of the world, at which point the game presumably truly opens up. And as part of this wild, open-ended adventure is the fact that Link has more options than ever before when it comes to getting around. Of course, he can run, swim, and jump at will for the first time in a 3D Zelda game, on top of climbing just about anything, riding a horse, going shield surfing, gliding with a paraglider, and even quick traveling to any shrine or tower he's visited before. Yeah, that's a lot of options. And while most of them are self-explanatory, I mean, do you really need me to explain jumping? A few of them do warrant a closer look like riding a horse, or more specifically, how you acquire a horse, in that it appears Link may have to actually work for it this time around, instead of just being given one like in past Zelda games. Because in the trailer, we can see Link carefully sneak up on a wild horse to avoid spooking it before hopping on and going for a ride. And it seems Link will have his pick of the litter, as there are at least three horses to be found here, which is actually a neat detail in and of itself, because wild horses tend to only travel as packs in real life, and that seems to be the case in Breath of the Wild too. Because between this scene and the footage from the 2014 Game Awards, every wild horse is seen so far has been part of a pack, which also means that sneaking up on one probably isn't going to be easy, as alarming any of them will likely alert the others too. In fact, we can see that demonstrated right here as soon as Link mounts a horse, because once it rears back in surprise, it spooks another horse just ahead. And in another realistic detail, the horses all don't look the same either. The horse that Link mounts here, for example, is dark with black hair, while the one in front is lighter with white hair. And yet a third distinct horse can be seen in the Guardian scene from Treehouse Live, this one being brown with a dark colored snout, as well as a distinctive white patch that runs down the middle of its face. And as it turns out, this is the exact same horse we've seen in every one of the game's trailers up to this point, including the latest from this year's E3, where we can see it crossing this bridge. Yep, even though the scene comes immediately after the one where Link acquires a horse, they're not the same horse. But how do we know for sure? Well, just look at its legs. This one has the same colored hair as the rest of the body, while this one has white, which matches the treehouse footage as well as the past trailers. Furthermore, this horse is also equipped with gear. We can see saddlebags and a tailbag, which also matches up with its appearance in all the other footage. So taken all together, is there something special about this horse in particular as opposed to all the others? Or is it just a coincidence that it's the only one Nintendo has shown as being fully decked out with gear? It's impossible to say, but we can't help but wonder this might actually be Link's main horse, with the wild ones only serving as temporary rides until he acquires a permanent one. In fact, could this horse be Epona? 
Sure, it may not have opponent's white hair, but it does share a similar distinctive mark on its face. And then there's a the fact that Nintendo referred to the same horse as Epona in the Game Awards footage. Although they have been a lot more coy on this matter since then. But regardless of whether it's Epona or not, Nintendo did confirm in a video with Katie Wilson that you will be able to name the horse. Which is both cool, and also doesn't exclude the possibility of it still being Epona, as you could change her name in Twilight Princess as well. Now, regardless of whether that specific horse is Link's main one or not, the fact that it's outfitted with gear suggests that there is indeed some way to obtain a main horse. Perhaps by taming one of the wild ones you find. After all, it would kinda suck if wild horses took off with all your gear, right? And on top of that, could that gear serve an actual purpose beyond just looking cool? After all, even though Link can already carry a lot by himself, could the horse's bags maybe expand his inventory even further? Now, as for how riding itself works, well, it seems pretty similar to past games, in that you're able to temporarily switch from a standard gallop into a full-out run, as we can see Link crouch down at various points and speed lines appear around him. Similarly, Link can still aim his bow and arrow while on horseback independent of the horse's movement. But check this out. We can see the horse turning slightly even while Link's aiming, which suggests he can still control the horse's movement with a control stick while aiming the bow with the motion controls. We then see Link jump off the horse before briefly using his glider, then pulling out the bow and arrow again to aim in slow motion. Now we did see something similar back in the Game Awards footage with Link dismounting and the aiming in slow motion, suggesting this effect takes place as soon as you disengage from either the horse or the paraglider while pulling out your bow. In fact, we can see a Nintendo rep making expert use of this technique in this scene by jumping off a cliff, then pulling out the glider for just a fraction of a second before putting it away and immediately pulling out the bow, thereby activating the slow motion feature. And we can also see here that the amount of time you can spend in slow motion is limited by the stamina gauge. But getting back to the horse, that old Game Awards footage might also reveal a couple of features that weren't touched on during E3, such as how we know Link will be able to swing his sword while riding, and the developers also commented back then that the horse will be able to steer itself to some degree in order to automatically avoid hazards like trees. Okay, I think that covers up pretty well for the horse, so let's move on to another major method in which Link will be getting around. Climbing. Or more specifically, how Link can now pretty much climb anything, whether it's a building, tower, or a freaking mountain. And seeing as it is such a major feature, the game elegantly teaches you how to do this at the very start, without you even knowing, as the Shrine of Resurrection features a short wall the Link has to climb in order to escape. And climbing really is a game changer in that almost nothing is off limits. Consider this. Most games use mountains, buildings, and other structures as obstacles to form paths and direct your movement. But in this case, it can actually aid Link's movement since he can go right over them or around them. And I mean that literally, he can climb around them which makes the world here even more expansive than most open world games. And that's nuts! But that doesn't mean the sky's the limit, as there are some limitations in place to prevent Link from getting around too easily. Which is why the stamina meter introduced in Skyward Sword is back, which only allows Link to climb and perform other specialized actions, like swimming, for as long as the meter holds out. And this can turn climbing into a bit of a puzzle by itself, as you may want to chart your path before starting a major climb to ensure you can find places to rest and regain your energy along the way. Alternatively, you can also eat certain foods that you've either found or cooked to regain energy, such as a cooked stamella shroom. But even still, given Link's stamina limitations and inventory size, it seems some areas may possibly be too tall for Link to climb, at least initially, which might force him to find another way around. And not only is climbing useful for getting around, but it's good for finding secrets too, such as climbing a random column or clambering along a low mountain wall down to a hidden ledge for some chests. Oh, and in a neat touch, did you notice how little bits of the mountain will break off as Link's climbing and bounce off it realistically as they fall? Ultimately, climbing might partly be why Nintendo's taken to referring to the game as open air instead of the usual open world, in that Link isn't just confined to the ground, especially once he obtains a paraglider from the old man. And not only is this baby Link's ticket off the plateau, but it'll allow him to reach far off areas much faster than he could ordinarily, like in this scene where he effortlessly glides over a valley. Unfortunately, being a glider, it doesn't so much fly as it does fall with style. But there is a way to gain some lift, namely by catching upward drafts created by fire, as demonstrated here in the Guardian battle. And according to Nintendo, the bigger the fire, the bigger the lift. Now what goes up must come down, right? And that might be why the developers gave Link a brand new ability where he can ride a shield like a snowboard, and he doesn't even have to be on snow to use it. Heck, he can even combine it with a paracel for some truly stylish gliding. Now there's a lot more to Breath of the Wild besides just getting around. After all, the journey's only half the adventure, right? And seeing as this game's all about the wild side, it's perhaps fitting that Link will have to forage for all kinds of things in order to survive, including food, materials, and weapons, among other items. And we can't overstate how big of a focus this is, as Link really will find all kinds of things all over the place. 
Now going off the inventory screen, we can see the game categorizes collectibles into 7 different types. And we can even see how many of each one Link can hold going by the amount of inventory slots. And those 7 categories are, weapons, of which Link can hold 8 different types, bows and arrows, of which he can hold 6 different types, shields, of which he can hold 4 different types, then we have armor, materials, food, and important items, all of which you can hold 20 each. Taken all together, Link can hold 98 different types of items at a time. And not only that, but he can actually hold on to multiples of any single item without eating up additional slots. So yeah, he can hold on to quite a few things. But that's for a pretty good reason, because he needs all the things he can get. Because, with the exception of important items and possibly armor, everything else isn't exactly built to last. Food and materials, for instance, are generally one use only. Whereas weapons, bows, and shields can be used multiple times, but they do degrade with use, eventually breaking apart in spectacular fashion. Now interestingly, arrows are a bit unique in that while they're technically one use, if you find one where it landed, you can pick it up and use it again. Yep, Link sure does know how to recycle. So all of this ties back into the game's wild nature, where Link's in a constant state of survival, and needs to be on the lookout for new things to replace the stuff he's currently using. Especially because, for the first time ever, Link won't find hearts to refill his health out in the environment. Instead, he can only regain health by consuming food. But luckily, he has quite a few options, at least in the plateau where food can be found everywhere. Whether it's a mushroom growing on a cave wall, or an apple you steal from the old man, or even a heart-shaped radish you find growing along a wall. Okay, I guess you technically can find hearts out in the wild. So I'll spare you from listing everything you can find, because there is a ton of stuff out there. And again, that's just in the plateau. We can only imagine what other delectables might lie in the great beyond. But Link isn't just a forager, he's a hunter too. And it seems all the wildlife is fair game for Link's stomach, such as boars, deer, or birds which instantly turn into a pile of collectible meat when killed. It's convenient and mess-free. Now while eating raw meat generally isn't a great idea in real life, Link has no such hang-ups. But if you do take the time to cook it by dropping it onto a fire and letting it simmer, it'll actually increase the meat's restorative properties. And get this, Nintendo explained that if you kill an enemy with fire, the meat will automatically be cooked. Now that's efficient. But cooking can do far more than just heat meat, because Link can use a pot to mix and match up to 5 different ingredients to create dishes with enhanced properties. So for example, if you cook a steak with 3 hearty truffles, you'll get the hearty meat and mushroom skewer, which not only fully restores Link's health, but also temporarily increases his heart gauge by 3, as represented here in yellow. Cooking really opens up a range of possibilities, allowing you to mix in things that otherwise have new regenerative properties on their own. For instance, cooking a bogoblin horn with a restless cricket, both of which are worthless by themselves, will yield an energizing elixir which restores your stamina. Another example is the spicy sautéed peppers, which are created by mixing together 5 spicy peppers. Individually, they only restore a half heart each, but when combined, it restores 5 hearts, or double what they would have otherwise. Plus, it makes Link resistant to the cold for 10 minutes. But not everything goes well together, which can result in a couple of less than desirable dishes. One potential result is a failed experiment, which only restores a quarter heart of health. And another is a dubious food, which the game describes as being too gross to even look at. Which is probably why the picture itself is even censored. But hey, it'll still restore a single heart. Now in order to go hunting, it might help to have some kind of weapon, right? And thankfully, those two are in abundance in the plateau, with at least 15 different types to find that range from tree branches, to a farmer's pitchfork, to clubs, and even skeleton arms? Now each weapon has a numerical rating denoting its attack power, and whenever you collect one, it shows how it compares in strength to your currently selected weapon. But not only does a weapon's strength differ, but also its range, use, and durability. Heck, even Link's animations will change, such as when swinging a heavy axe which takes a lot more effort. Otherwise, weapons, like swords, work pretty similar to past games, except now there are a couple of new abilities, such as how Link can now throw his weapon for a long-range attack, and this will actually inflict double the damage. But then again, it does leave you unarmed, so it's generally best to use this as a final attack just before the weapon breaks. Another new ability is a Link can counterattack in slow motion if he performs a well-timed dodge, which should come in useful. Now, even though almost all of the weapons are for close-range attacks, there is at least one exception, being the Fire Rod, which shoots out bouncing balls of fire that ignite anything they touch. Now, the Fire Rod is nothing new for Zelda, but historically, it's been a major item found inside dungeons, whereas here, it's a throwaway item found inside a typical chest, which makes sense seeing as it is breakable. In fact, this item is so fragile that it'll break upon impact with anything, meaning it's exclusively for long-range use. But like the other weapons, you can charge this one up for a spin attack too, although in this case, it'll shoot out 5 fireballs at once. Which, as you can see, is a pretty quick way to start a massive wildfire. Now since the fire rod does return from past games, we wouldn't be surprised if some other Zelda rods come back too. Or at the least, the ice rod, seeing as that's another element already represented in the game with ice arrows and ice-based enemies. 
Now, as we mentioned before, the game actually treats bows separately from weapons, despite the fact that bows are also weapons. And they too are assigned to strength, which not only affects the bow's power, but also its range. Yep, range is now a factor, as arrows can fall short of your target. Now not only do you have your choice of bows, but arrows too. And we know of four different types they can find in the plateau, including normal arrows, ice arrows, which can freeze enemies in place, fire arrows, which are especially effective against cold-based enemies, and bomb arrows. But although it may not be in the plateau, we know there's a fifth arrow type too, being the energy-based one we discussed earlier. And speaking of arrows, the amount in his quiver visibly drops as he starts to run out, which is a neat detail. Next up, we have armor. Now, of course, Link comes equipped to the birthday suit by default, but it won't do much to protect him against the enemies, or even the elements. Hell, he can barely even open chests when naked, as you'll quickly discover how painful it can be to kick one open without shoes. Now, armor comes in two forms, shirts and pants, which include shoes. And Link can even mix and match different sets together. And like weapons, each piece of armor comes with its own strength rating that makes Link increasingly resistant to taking damage. But some clothing come with other perks too. In the case of the quilted shirt, for example, it also makes Link more resistant to the cold. And then we have shields, and like most everything else, they too can be destroyed. Yep, even while using it as a snowboard. It's almost like shields weren't meant for riding or something. Now, there's not too much else to say about shields, except that if you block an attack right before it lands, it'll result in a perfect guard, temporarily throwing the enemy off balance. Okay, so clearly there's quite a few things to collect. But, you may have noticed one Zelda staple that seems to be missing, besides hearts. Rupees! I mean, during Nintendo's nearly 10 hour long demonstration, not a single one appeared. What is this madness? Is Hyrule experiencing some kind of financial crisis? But despite this, rupees will actually appear in the game. After all, there's a counter right there on the inventory screen, plus some materials, like Sapphire, even state in their description that they can be sold for a high price. Which also basically confirms that merchants will appear in the game too. After all, you'll need someone to sell to. But as it turns out, there actually is at least one rupee to be found in the E3 demo. If you search by this guardian just outside the Temple of Time, check out what shows up. Yep, a purple rupee, and it's worth 50 smackers. So it seems like you'll still be able to find money lying around. It's just going to be a lot rarer than before. Which also makes it a bit more realistic, considering the fact that Long Keepers could probably live like kings in past Zelda games. So clearly, there's quite a few things for Link to find in this world. And as with most Zelda games, Link can bring up the inventory screen to choose which ones he wants to equip. But the game also features a quick select option that allows you to easily equip shields, swords, and runes by holding left, right, or up respectively on the D-pad, while then using the right control stick to scroll through them. But what about bows and arrows? Well, you can quick select those too. You just have to pull out your bow first to change the quick select options to those instead. And putting it away will change them back. And speaking of which, some people have theorized that this quick select might hint at one of the NX's rumored features, because of this pattern discovered last year, which revealed Nintendo's possible plans for shoulder buttons made out of scroll wheels. So instead of using the D-pad and control sticks, you might just have to spin a wheel to choose your sword or shield instead. Okay, so we've covered all the major different types of things a Link can find. Except for one, runes. Now, as we've already mentioned, there are four of them in the E3 demo, one for each of the shrines. And they are Stasis, Magnesis, Cryonis, and Remote Bomb. So, let's break these down real quick. And let's start with Magnesis, which gives Link control of a giant magnet. Once activated, the game will highlight any metallic objects within range, even if it's underwater, which also allows you to quickly see the depth of the lake. And once you latch onto something, you can move the object around by tilting the gamepad, or you can bring it closer or push it farther away by using the D-pad. And you can really put quite some distance on it. But since it can be tricky to gauge where exactly it is at those distances, there's a blue marker directly underneath that shows exactly where the object will land once you let go. And along those lines, Magnesis can be a powerful weapon too. Not only can you use it to drop heavy objects right onto enemies, but you can even swing it into them too. Hell, you can even drop your weapon, pick it up with Magnesis, and then use that to swing it around several meters away from Link. How awesome is that? Next up is the Stasis Rune, which allows you to freeze a selected object in place for a limited amount of time. You can even see chains appear as you do so, locking it in place. So if you want to stop a giant machine for instance, just freeze one of the gears, which will then allow Link to cross over safely. But the catch is that you can only freeze a single object at a time. And even then, there's a delay after the stasis wears off before you can do it again, which prevents you from freezing the same object in place over and over again. But wait, there's more! Because you can actually use this ability to move things too, which doesn't really seem to make much sense at first. But you see, while the object itself may be frozen, you can attack it to build up kinetic energy. And that energy will be unleashed all at once the moment the stasis runs out. So the more you attack it, the farther the object will fly, as indicated by the arrow that appears, which not only points in the direction the energy will be unleashed, but also signifies how far, both by growing longer while also turning red. 
Doing this, he can launch things like massive boulders around the world as if they were nothing. Then we have the remote bomb rune, or should we say runes, because it technically takes up two slots. One of those bombs is round, it will roll along the terrain, while the other one's a cube, it will tend to stay where you put it. But regardless of which one you use, you get to decide when it's detonated with a tap of the L button. But once you have, you'll have a brief wait while the meter refills before you can use it again. Which is a pretty big change from how bombs used to work in the Zelda games, being inventory based. As opposed to this time where you can't run out of them. Finally, we have Cryonis. And we have to say the Link Sheikah Slate must be pretty powerful if you can run Cryonis. <laughs> Anyways, this one lets Link create pillars of ice from any body of water. That's cool, I guess. Okay, even though it might not sound that exciting, it actually can do some pretty cool things. Now the most obvious one is that it can help Link reach otherwise inaccessible areas, which is especially useful in the shrines where Link can't otherwise climb the walls. Or he can use them as stepping stones, such as to cross over an ice-cold lake that can deal damage. But what's even cooler, so to speak, is how you can use it for physics-based puzzles, such as creating a pillar to lift a closed gate, or tilting a platform on one side like a seesaw to create a ramp. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, almost literally, when it comes to physics in Breath of the Wild, but we'll have more on that in a second. Now, although we never see all four runes collected at once in the E3 demo, we do know that together, they occupy five slots in the rune screen. Remember, the remote bomb takes up two. But interestingly, there are actually six slots on the rune screen, not counting the amiibo one. Which means there's room, or should we say rune, for one more. And if we assume all runes are only found within shrines, that means the final one has to be found in a shrine outside of the plateau, making it the odd one out. Weird, right? Of course, it's also possible that the fifth rune isn't attached to a shrine at all, and instead has some other requirement. Regardless, it's also surprising that Link found what appears to be the majority of his powers so early into the game, so we can't help but wonder there might be more to them, such as maybe being able to upgrade them in some way. Perhaps that's what the spirit orbs are for. It would make sense if Link could eventually freeze objects for longer periods of time, or maybe make bomb explosions bigger, but we're just speculating. Now what makes most of these runes possible, as well as much else about Breath of the Wild, is the game's spiffy new physics engine. As in, it's everywhere, and it introduces subtleties and gameplay possibilities that Zelda fans have never had to think about before, such as how trees can now organically be used to solve puzzles, whether it's cutting one down and floating it down a river to use as a platform, or carefully chopping down another in the right direction so that it falls across a gap, creating a bridge. And even then, the tree isn't fully stable, so you'll have to be careful the Link's weight doesn't cause it to roll away from underneath you. Oh, and if you screw up entirely, you might be out of luck, at least until those trees grow back, which Nintendo assured us that they would at E3, they just didn't specify how long that might take. Although we did notice that there might be a way to cheat the system, since the tree here did come back immediately after Link got a game over. Well, I guess Link always has been one to manipulate time to his advantage. Now another example of the physics shows up with boulders that you'll occasionally find, often placed precariously on a ledge right over an enemy camp. But before you push it off, you might want to take into account how the terrain will affect the boulder's path. And yeah, this goes for round bombs too. But it's not just the terrain you'll have to take into account, but wind too. Now, we haven't seen too many examples of this yet, but there is an area of the plateau that features a strong gust of wind blowing at all times. And not only does it affect the foliage, like the grass here, but even the fire and its smoke too. And it's not just for looks, as it'll even affect Link 2 blowing a bomb right out of his hands. Yeah, the wind here kinda blows. Then we have fire and its physics. Now, although you'll find several campfires throughout the plateau, you can also make your own wherever you want, as long as you have firewood and flint. Just drop the flint and strike it with a metal object, like a sword, to create a spark. And as long as you have some wood nearby, it'll ignite. And that fire can spread onto other wooden objects too, like sticks, bows, or even barrels. Although larger objects like barrels will take a little bit longer to catch on fire. Oh, and if you're carrying fire around with you, like on a torch, you can ignite bushes or grass too, but it does tend to fizzle out pretty quickly. Unless you're in an area with a lot of dry grass, like in that same windy area. The conditions here are perfect for the fire to spread, which can result in a mini wild forest fire, which can be especially useful if you want to get some hang time with your glider. You can even use a physics to create some rudimentary simple machines. For instance, as the guys over at Nintendo Sphere discovered, if you position a plank over an object, like a chest, to use as a pivot, then place something on one side of the plank, like Link, and then drop a heavy object on the other, well, you just created yourself a catapult that can launch Link sky high. Pretty impressive, right? And we're just scratching the surface of things that you can do with the physics in the game, as we're pretty sure there'll be many other crazy things that you can do, whether or not the developers intended for it. The physics really add yet another wild element in the game which makes it feel more real than ever before. And something else that helps make the world feel alive is the varying climate and weather patterns. Now in the E3 demo, we only really got a taste of the former, with snow found in the higher mountain elevations. And as part of the game's attention to realism, the temperature not only drops the higher up you go, but it will drop even farther at night. 
In fact, temperature plays a rather large role in the game, as reflected in the fact it gets its own on-screen temperature gauge, which visibly catches on fire if Link's on fire, or freezes over when Link's frozen. And speaking of which, there are a few ways to combat the cold, but the most effective method is, of course, to wear warm clothing. And articles that are especially cold resistant are marked on the inventory screen. But besides clothing, some food, like the spicy elixir, will temporarily increase Link's resistance to the cold, which in this case is for 9 minutes and 50 seconds. But failing that, Link can also make a fire too, which will keep him warm as long as he stays close. Now climates are one thing, but weather is another, because what's sunny one moment might be rainy the next. Now again, we didn't see any examples of this in the E3 demo, but the trailer does show at least one example, with a scene of the Temple of Time on a dark and stormy night, which is of course in stark contrast to its appearance in the demo. It's then followed by this scene of the nearby forest where lightning strikes a tree and starts a fire, which seems like it might be another hazard for Link to watch out for. And in another scene, we can see lightning strike a structure here that it possibly destroys. Now in both instances, the lightning appears to be striking taller objects, much like it does in real life. And like in real life, the time of day changes too. Yeah, that really is the best transition I could think of. Hey, I've been working on this for a couple of months, okay? Cut me some slack. Now, granted, day and night cycles are nothing new for Zelda, but Breath of the Wild features one of the longest ones yet, clocking in at 24 minutes in total. Which is to say that for every minute of our time, one hour passes in Zelda. And for the first time, so to speak, the game displays the exact time digitally in the lower right corner, albeit in 5 minute increments. But interestingly, that clock disappears when you enter a shrine. But don't let that fool you, because time still continues to pass at the exact same rate. Yep, we measured it. So I guess shrines are basically the casinos of Hyrule, in that they're windowless and you have no idea how much time has passed until you step back outside. And in case you did lose track of time, don't worry, because you can always just stop at a campfire to fast forward time to morning, noon, or night. And in case you were wondering what a full day looks like, the Japanese website for Breath of the Wild actually revealed a full 24 minute video of the entire day and night cycle, which we sped up here. And it provides a wonderful look at how things change over the course of a day, such as the color of the sky, shadows that move with the sun's position, fog that comes and goes, and even the clouds can be seen changing direction with the wind. That's attention to detail. But this video has a couple of other interesting things about it too. For one, shortly after night falls, what appears to be a meteorite flies in and crashes into the ground, kicking up quite a lot of dirt in the process. And in a neat touch, you can even see it reflected in the water as it comes crashing in. But it seems this isn't just for show, because a beacon of light shines at the impact point, suggesting there's something there for Link to find. Maybe some kind of valuable material? But interestingly, it seems like Link may have a limited amount of time to find it, because that beacon of light disappears just a little over five and a half minutes later. So is it on a set time limit? Or does its disappearance perhaps correlate with the rising sun, which happens mere moments later? Regardless, we wonder if the meteorite might possibly hint at a greater celestial theme to the game. After all, those lighted circle and line patterns we talked about before do also somewhat resemble constellation drawings. And going off this potentially wild idea, let's take a look at the outside of the shrines again, where the base of it appears to be more Earth-like in appearance, whereas we can see the constellation-like line pattern at the top, closer to the stars. And could the tower has perhaps been built as a way to get closer to the star-filled sky, kind of like the biblical Tower of Babel? Hey, we're just throwing out ideas, okay? And speaking of celestial themes, did you notice a moon here? Or rather, how it's only a partial moon, a waxing crescent to be specific? Well, we know the moon won't always appear that way based on this scene in the trailer which appears to show one closer to a three-quarter moon, which means that the moon phases from Wind Waker are back. Now in that game, it affected various events, like the location of the ghost ship, so we think it might have some kind of effect on the gameplay this time too, we're just not sure what. Okay, so by now it should be pretty clear that the world in Breath of the Wild feels alive. Again, it all ties back into the wildness of it all. And something else that helps with this is the fact that it's teeming with life, whether it's a vast amount of plants and foliage to be found, or all kinds of wildlife. I mean, you'll find squirrels squirreling up and down trees, fish and bodies of water, boars and deer in forests, and all kinds of birds. You'll often even see them flying around in the sky in a V formation, which is a neat touch. And of course, you can hunt any of them if you so choose, too. You can even go bug hunting if you want, like in Twilight Princess or Skyward Sword. Heck, even the enemies feel more natural than ever before, because they now feel like an actual part of the world. In the Plateau, for instance, Bokoblins are the most frequent antagonists, which isn't really anything new for Zelda. But this time, they seem to actually exist as part of this world, as you'll mostly find them living as groups inside different types of encampments. It might be a small camp with a fire roasting meat, or something as grandiose as setting up home inside a giant skull. By contextualizing the enemy's existence, it really makes this feel like more of a world, while also making the Bokoblins feel a little bit smarter than they typically have. In fact, they not only seem smarter, but they actually are smarter, and this plays into Breath of the Wild's newfound emphasis on stealth, which we touched on a bit earlier with the wild horses, because Link now has the ability to crouch to stay out of sight, 
and an on-screen meter even shows how much sound Link is making, which are both features brand new to the Zelda series. Okay, I guess you could crouch in Zelda too, but we don't really count that, do we? And if Link manages to sneak up on the enemy sight unseen, he can perform a sneak strike that appears to be an instant kill, at least for the book goblins here. And that's a technique that's especially useful at night, when you can sneak up on the sleeping camp to take them all down before they even know what's happening to them. But sneaking up on book goblins is easier said than done, because if Link's not careful, he'll arouse their suspicion, as indicated by the question marks up here over their head, and they'll begin to investigate immediately. But you can use their newfound intelligence against them too, such as by distracting them with the sound of a misplaced arrow or an exploding bomb to lure them away, which gives Link a chance to get into a better position and pick them off. But things can get even trickier when you factor in the ones in the watchtowers who will sound their horns if they see you, instantly alerting the others to your presence. And speaking of which, if the book goblins actually see or discover Link at any point, then an exclamation mark will appear over their heads, showing that they're in attack mode. And this is where we can see how clever they really can be, because even though they almost always start an arm since they're just chilling at camp, as soon as they learn of a threat, they'll actually run over to their weapon stash and arm themselves, potentially including shields too. And some even go the extra mile of igniting their clubs by dipping it into fire, making them even more of a danger. So basically, the longer you take, the greater the threat they pose, which makes sneaking up on them and taking them all out quickly all the more important. Ultimately, the Book Goblin's IQ bump really turns every camp into a mini puzzle of sorts, giving you a ton of options. What angle is best to approach from? Do you try to sneak up and take them down all silently, or attack from afar? Or do you try and steal or burn all their weapons instead? Or heck, if there's a beehive nearby, you can try shooting that down instead and letting the bees have their fun. And that's just a small amount of the possibilities. And it seems like you'll have plenty of opportunities to exercise your options, since Bogoblins appear to be pretty common enemies even outside of the plateau, as we can see them also appear in a desert setting, and on horseback in the field leading up to Hyrule Castle. But even though Bogoblins may be smart, relatively speaking, the typical red ones aren't terribly strong, but there is a rarer blue variety as well, who has a lot more HP, and is also equipped with better weapons, like a sword instead of a wooden club. Now in Skyward Sword, the Bokoblins wore skulls as accessories, but this time it's turned into a full-on obsession, as not only do they wear mini skulls around their necks, but they also use bones as support beams for their structures, with random piles of bones also found nearby for good measure. And as we touched on before, they even live inside giant skulls at times. And speaking of which, those skulls really are huge. What kind of creature did it come from? And could that creature still exist in this world? Or is it too a relic of the past? And speaking of relics from the past, another enemy seen in the plateau are the very skeletons of the Bokoblins you're fighting, called Skull Bokoblins. Huh, so maybe this explains why the Bokoblins are so fascinated with skeletons. Okay, now these guys only appear at night, burrowing up from underground, meaning you'll have to keep on your toes since you never know when one might attack. But given their fragile nature, they'll actually fall apart as you battle them. They might lose an arm, or even their head. Yep, you could say Link really pulled ahead in that battle. But even when detached, the body parts and bodies will attempt to reunite, although they're not too picky about whose body they reattach to. Now, if Link gets to one of those body parts first, he can actually use them as weapons himself. The arm can be equipped like a sword, even as it creepily wiggles around, or he can punt the head like a football to inflict some damage from a distance. Yeah, it's a little messed up! Now, while Bokoblins and Skull Bokoblins will account for most of your enemy encounters, there are a couple of other dangerous creatures lurking out in the plateau, such as Churros, or, I mean, Choo Choo's, which can also suddenly pop up from the ground. And then there's also Zelda's famous bat enemy, Keese. Now both enemies are usually pretty weak, but they both do come in an ice variety found in the snowy mountain that can freeze Link on impact, which makes them both just a little bit more dangerous. And based on the ice versions, we'd be very surprised if fire variants don't show up too, especially for Key since they've already appeared in that form in past games. Now in the case of Choo Choo's, they always seem to drop Choo Choo jelly after being defeated. And the description for the normal ones a bit interesting, because it states that, although it's unusable in its current gelatinous state, applying electricity may change its form which suggests that Link may be able to come across sources of electricity in the environment, similar to fire and how it interacts with nearby objects. And by electricity, do they mean the blue energy we've already talked about ad nauseum? If that's the case, maybe Link can use his energized arrows to have the same effect. Anyways, that covers it for all the common elements found in the plateau, but there is one more encounter we haven't talked about yet, and it's a big one. Although it may not seem like it at first, because he's completely hidden. It's only when you step into the clearing here that the rocks magically group together forming a giant rock monster, called the Step Talus. Which is a rather fitting name considering that Step is defined as an extensive plain, especially one without trees, and Talus refers to a deposit formed by an accumulation of broken rock debris. At any rate, the game treats this as a major encounter, perhaps even a boss encounter given that it's the only enemy to have its name displayed on screen at all times, along with a giant health bar. But seeing as it is a giant rock monster, how do you attack it? After all, in the words of Tim Allen, 
rock, it doesn't have any photobox spots! But thankfully, this one actually does have a weak point. It's that black rock on top of its head, or what we think is its head. It's just getting to it that can be tricky, since Link needs to get close enough to climb up its body while avoiding being pounded by its swinging fists, which it can also throw as projectiles. And it's not like he can run out of them either, since he can just dig up another rock as a replacement. There is a pretty useful trick though, because if you're quick, you can actually hop aboard at the very start as he's assembling himself to get some easy hits in. Now you can also attack his weak point from afar with arrows, and bomb arrows seem especially effective in particular. And as a bonus, arrows will actually stun the creature momentarily, giving Link a good opportunity to get close and climb him without fear. Just be aware, they may toss Link off after a few direct hits. Now once you finally defeat him, Link will be rewarded with a bunch of amber and a valuable ruby. Alright, and that carves up for all the creatures we can see in the plateau. But what about those that we can't see? Because there's still one more left that we haven't talked about yet. The Koroks. And that's for a good reason, because these guys are invisible until you happen to cross their hiding spot, at which point they'll instantly materialize and express how surprised they are that Link can see them. Now Koroks, as a species, are nothing new, having previously appeared in the Wind Waker, but they haven't been seen since until now. And as it turns out, the Koroks this time aren't just any Koroks, they're the exact same Koroks. Or at least that's the case for the five we've seen so far, which includes Oaken, who's in a pond, Hollow, who's hiding under a rock in the forest, Aldo, who lurks on top of the Temple of Time, Olivio on top of the Woodcutter's Cabin, and Urch under this distinctive tree in the forest. And their reappearance seems particularly apt in the game all about nature, given that they're made of wood, have leaves or faces, and are collectively known as the Children of the Woods. Now each time you find one, they'll give Link a Korok seed. And according to the game's description, if Link gathers a bunch of them, something might just happen. But what? Well, whatever it is, it's probably pretty important since we know the seeds go into the important items category on your inventory screen. And since they are, well, seeds, we're also pretty sure you'll be able to plant them somewhere and make something grow. I know, pretty shocking, right? But furthermore, we have a feeling the thing it grows into might just be a tree, given that in the Wind Waker, the Koroks had an annual tradition of planting trees around the world. In fact, could it possibly grow into the Great Tree, who watched over the Koroks in the Wind Waker? It's probably far-fetched, but hey, you never know. Anyways, even though we've only seen five Koroks in Breath of the Wild, there were ten of them in the Wind Waker, which means we're pretty sure there's at least five more to find in this game too. And we wouldn't be surprised if they too are in the plateau. After all, ten's a nice round number, don't you think? And if that's the case, we can't help but wonder there might be Koroks to find in every region. It would seem a bit odd that they're mostly confined to the plateau, after all. So is it possible that you might be able to do something with the seeds for every 10 that you find? Or will you have to collect them all for them to be useful? Now one thing that's missing from the plateau, or really most anywhere else that we've seen, is any sign of civilized life. I mean, the only actual humanoid character we've seen besides Link is the old man. Now sure, there are hints of what used to be civilized life, like with the buildings left in ruin, but that's about it. Although there is one exception, the woodcutter's cabin. And not only is it in good condition, but it also appears to be inhabited based on the lit fire outside and the lit lantern near the entrance. So since there's no one else around, could this be the old man's primary residence? He does carry a very similar looking lantern around with him after all. Plus, we can even see him near the cabin in the trailer, using an axe to chop down a tree. Heck, he may have even used that very axe to build a cabin himself. Now, despite the mysterious lack of characters so far, Nintendo has confirmed the towns do in fact exist in the game. In fact, we may have seen proof of this way back in the original reveal trailer, where we not only see some intact buildings, but even several villagers out in the fields. Now granted, the game probably has changed to some degree since then, but it is possible we'll see something along those lines. And on top of that, we ourselves have heard from a reliable source that one of those towns is likely to be a Goron City, which makes sense given that they're rock creatures in a game with rock climbing. So we'd be very surprised if Link isn't able to climb some of those Gorons and maybe even hitch a free ride, especially given how big some of those Gorons can be. And of course, towns and cities in most open world games are generally ripe with side quests, and we don't expect Breath of the Wild to be any different. Especially based on the giant message here that flashes on screen when Link learns of the objective to head to the tower, which then gets marked complete when he finishes it. Why else would the game do that unless more quests are to be expected? Alright, so let's see here. We've covered the opening of the game, Link, Zelda, Ganon, the setting, towers, guardians, enemies, abilities, physics, and pretty much everything else in Breath of the Wild. I guess we're about done here, except we haven't really talked about the world much itself. And there's a lot to talk about. Now we've already covered the plateau pretty well, and you're probably sick of seeing it anyway, but I do want to draw special attention to the highest place in all of the plateau being the peak of Mount Hylia, and it offers an amazing view of the world. But there's something strange up here, as in that weird rock formation with one giant rock in the middle held up by some smaller ones surrounding it. What the heck is that about? We don't know for sure, but we do have one idea. 
because it did remind us of the statue of the goddess, Hylia, in the Temple of Time, which itself is a large structure surrounded by several smaller ones. So is it possible this is some kind of ancient tribute to the goddess? It would make sense seeing as this is the highest point of the plateau where it'd be closest to the heavens. And then there is a little fact that this is literally called Mount Hylia, as in named after the goddess. Huh. Now despite how tall Mount Hylia is, Nintendo confirmed it's not the highest point of the game. In fact, we can see that the nearby mountains to the south are even taller. So it got us thinking, how much taller could a mountain realistically get? Well, there's no way to know for sure, but we may have some idea. And it's all thanks to the map. Because the map is actually colored based on altitude. So the higher something is, the lighter it gets. We can see this with the dark brown edges of the plateau, which are the lowest points, whereas the highest point, being Mount Hylia's peak, is considerably lighter. And we can use this information to get a general idea of relative altitudes, as well as predict the possible tallest peak in the game. Now to simplify things, we've converted the map into a black and white image, giving us only two colors to worry about, with pure black representing the lowest possible altitude, and pure white being the highest. And by using Photoshop's eyedropper tool, we can actually select different parts of the region and immediately compare the relative altitudes by the color's position on this line. So the edge of the plateau is consistently and predictably on the low end of the scale, with this being the lowest point, or only 21% of the way up, which is to say it's not at the bottom, which makes sense since the entire plateau is higher than the surrounding territory. So we think the bottom of the meter, being pure black, might represent the sea level, which might also possibly be the elevation of the surrounding terrain. In which case, this would show us exactly how high up off the ground the lowest point of the plateau is. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, if we select Mount Hylia's peak, we can see how much higher it really is, at just under halfway up the meter, or to be exact, 46% of the way to the top. But beyond that, since pure white would be the highest possible point, that means it's technically possible that there could be another mountain range elsewhere in the game that's just slightly over twice as high as Mount Hylia. Now granted, that doesn't mean the developers would quite go that crazy, but hey, they might, and it shows the kind of scale we might be dealing with here, at least vertically. But what about horizontally? After all, Nintendo has confirmed that the plateau itself makes up less than 2% of the entire world. But how big is that really? I mean, it's one thing to hear how big it is, and another to see how big it is. Now you might be thinking, we've already seen how big it is, on the map screen, which allows us to not only see the entire plateau, but the world beyond it as well. But, you can't quite see the entire thing at once, even when fully zoomed out. So, we went ahead and pieced it all together. Here's a plateau, and the rest of the world. Pretty huge, right? But this image may not tell the full story for a couple of reasons. For one, it's possible that this map may not actually represent the full world, because we can clearly see the region boundaries extend beyond the faded edge of the map. So is it possible that Link can explore even beyond what we can see? Probably not, but we wouldn't completely rule out the idea either. After all, the game's director does refer to the plateau as Central Hyrule, despite the plateau clearly not being in the exact center. Instead, it's about a plateau's length away, to the southwest, which might lend credence to the idea that there's even more of the world beyond the boundaries of what we can see on the map, specifically to the southwest, thereby making the plateau the geographical center. But that is assuming he wasn't just using the word central a bit liberally, which again is a more likely option. Especially since, as far as we can tell, there is no reason for the world to extend any farther than it currently does. After all, why would the game allow us to view such a massive part of the world that we haven't yet reached, yet still hide even more beyond the boundary? And that takes us to our next point, because even at its current size, the full map actually allows for a world far bigger than it needs to be, based on the fact that the plateau represents, at most, 2% of it. In fact, based on our calculations, the map's active area, as shown here, is 125 times larger than the plateau, which would then make the plateau a mere 0.8% of the total world. Or in other words, that would make the world itself possibly up to twice the size that Nintendo is claiming, since the plateau would be making up less than 1% of it. Now granted, Nintendo did say that the plateau represents less than 2% of the world, making this technically possible, but we'll get back to that in just a moment. Okay, now you might be wondering, how do we know all this about the size stuff? Well, we actually measured the damn thing. And this was a bit trickier than you might think, because even though the map itself is obviously a rectangle, and there's even a grid overlay to help with measurements, the plateau itself isn't a rectangle at all. Which means that figuring out the size is a lot trickier than just counting up how many grid spaces it takes up. So what we did instead was count pixels, specifically how many pixels made up the plateau, as well as the amount of pixels in each grid space. And then we used some ancient Hylian magic, aka rudimentary math, to do the rest. So let's go over our findings. Okay, so at the maximum zoomed out scale, the plateau is roughly the area of 54 grid spaces, as represented here by the little red box. And since we know that the plateau represents 2% of the world at most, this means that the world is conservatively 50 times bigger than the plateau, 
or 2700 grid spaces, as represented here by the green box. But again, Nintendo did say multiple times that the plateau represents less than 2%, and since they use 2% and not 1% as a reference point, we're guessing that means that the plateau has to be somewhere between 1.1% and 1.9% of the total world, and we're also guessing it's probably going to be closer to that latter figure. So let's take a look at how much bigger the world could possibly be using that range. And first up is how the world would look assuming the plateau represents 1.9% of it, or in other words, a world that's 52 times bigger, as shown here with the yellow box. Yeah, it's not much of a difference from the 2% figure. So let's step it up a notch, this time to what we think is likely its maximum possible size of the 1.5% figure, or in other words, a world that's 66 times larger than the plateau, as displayed here by the purple box. But come on, you know us, we like to explore all possible options at Game Explain. so let's take a look at how big the world could be, assuming the plateau represents just 1.1% of a world that's 91 times bigger, as shown here with the light blue box. Yeah, we're just getting ridiculous now, but as you might note, it still fits within the confines of the existing map screen quite easily. Okay, now obviously land masses aren't square shaped, so here's what that amount of land might look like in a more natural form, using the same shape of the plateau as a guide. So here it is at 1.9%, 1.5%, and 1.1%. And once again, we can see even in the unlikeliest case to the largest size, it still doesn't fill the entirety of the map screen. Which of course means that this entire map can't all be land, or at least, land that's accessible. Which got us thinking about the various regions that make up this world. Because so far, we only know of one for sure, being the plateau. But the outlines on the map appear to reveal the others. And it would appear that there may be 15 regions in total. But here's the thing. It's entirely possible some of those regions aren't actually regions at all, but only seem to be because of the negative space created by actual regions. So for example, if this is a region, and this is a region, the one in between may not be at all, but only have the appearance of one since it shares the same borders. So could something like this be the case? Well, we did some digging, and probably not. Because here's the thing, we counted how many towers we can see from the plateau, some of which can just barely be seen, and we came up with 13 of them, including the plateaus. We then went through a painstaking process of actually mapping out where in the world those 13 are. Trust me, it's a total pain in the keister. And sure enough, it confirms our theory from way earlier, like an hour ago now, gosh, how long is this thing, that each tower is in a different region. So that counts for 13 of the 15 regions right there, leaving only these two left with towers that we haven't yet accounted for. But that doesn't mean they don't exist, because we found at least one other tower, and possibly two, in the E3 trailer that we can't match up with anywhere else which means it has to belong to one of these two regions, leaving at best a single region we can't account for, even though we might be able to as well, and we'll show you exactly what we're talking about soon. So based on all this, we're pretty sure that means that all 15 of these regions are the real deal, meaning that there's 15 towers to find too. In fact, we'll even show you as best as we can where exactly you can expect to find most, if not all of those towers, among other landmarks too, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the regions, but there's still one question left, what exactly are the regions? I mean, do their boundaries as outlined on the map correlate to anything? They obviously do in the case of the plateau, where the boundaries reflect the plateau's edge, but as far as we can tell, the rest of the world has no such clear boundaries. It seems like one region may just blend into the next. In fact, each region's boundaries, except for the plateau, appear to be pretty much arbitrary. I mean, look at this thin little section that hugs a plateau wall. What's the reason for that? So at this point, it seems the regions may be mostly for mapping purposes, and maybe the Korok seeds as we suggested earlier. But is that really it? Or could there possibly be another function to the regions? Well, we do have one wild idea, and it plays off our other wild idea from earlier, where we propose that the plateau may be able to be raised or lowered. Again, I know it's insane, but stick with me. What if that applied to every region? As in, every single one could be raised or lowered independently. This could allow for some insane puzzles on a worldwide scale where you may have to lower one region in order to glide to it from another you raised. And perhaps you could control all of this from any of the towers. It would explain the antenna if you can control them all remotely. Look, again, we know this is a crazy idea, but Breath of the Wild is all about switching up the formula, right? Alright, I think that's quite enough about region boundaries, because let's face it, outside of crazy ideas, region boundaries are boring! Instead, there's a giant world out there for us to explore! Now we've already covered the plateau pretty darn well, but the thing about the plateau is that it's your entry point into the rest of the world, because once you get the paraglider, you can then glide from it in any direction you choose. Yep, the world really is your oyster. So let's take a look at what might be waiting for Link beyond the plateau's boundaries. And let's go ahead and start with the north and work our way around the world clockwise. And of course, the biggest point of interest to the north is Hyrule Castle, which we've already talked about a fair amount. Now from this vantage point, it really doesn't seem like it's all that far away. 
but looks can be deceiving, because we know exactly how far away it really is, since we placed a pin on it during E3 showing its exact location on the map. And we measure that distance, and it's roughly the length of two and a half plateaus away. From the plateau, obviously. So yeah, it's pretty far. And that's not even halfway to the edge of the visible map, which is about 120% of that same distance. Again, this is a big, big world. Now, even though we've already discussed Hyrule Castle a fair amount, there's still even more we haven't touched on yet, which we can see even better if we enhance the contrast to the image. First up is the fact that we can see a path leads right up to the castle, before then winding up and to the left, presumably to the castle entrance itself. Although, there does appear to be a gap in the path as you get close. So, could there be a moat surrounding the castle like there has been in past games? We might just see a glimpse of what could be water in this zoomed out picture down here, and here. So we wonder that gap might indicate that you won't be able to easily reach a castle, or at least not right away. But could he climb up to it instead, or maybe use his paraglider? Maybe, but he might not be able to climb those pillars that are made out of the same material as the shrines, which it seems like they might be, and there doesn't appear to be anything else close by they could paraglide from either. And speaking of gaps, in one of the more zoomed out pictures released for the game, we can see what might be a gap in the castle itself, as if it's perched above the ground, exposing the mountain behind it. It could just be a visual trick, but we can see the exact same thing in a picture at a different angle. In fact, the right side of the castle sure does look rather mountainous. It all looks very remote and intimidating. A bit more wild, if you will. Especially with those weird spikes sticking out the side of the castle. What's going on there? Are they related to Ganon in some way? They might be, especially considering the entire castle appears to be purple, a bit like Ganon. And finally, we can see the hallmark spires of Hyrule Castle that top the towers, including what may be a bridge connecting them back to the castle. Okay, and that covers up our Hyrule Castle, but what about everything that leads up to it from the plateau? Well, as it turns out, that's exactly where this Guardian battle takes place. In fact, if you freeze it here, we can actually see the plateau in the distance. There's a Temple of Time, and there's a Plateau's Tower. And speaking of towers, we can see the one that belongs to this region close by, and it's clearly already been activated by Link as it's blue, with the antenna-like things in the raised position. So our guess is that the tower is somewhere around here on the map, with the Guardian scene taking place not too far east of it. But besides that, and some nearby trees, this area seems to be mostly open fields. Which of course is perfect for a Guardian battle. But there is a branching path here that splits through the field. One's heading east, another west, and we wonder if this one heading north might lead to the castle. We can also see a few flags around here that appear to mark the trail's path, perhaps making it easier to spot from a distance. And finally, there are some ruins around here too. Could that be where the Guardian came from? Now we actually get a much better look at this general area in this far out view overlooking the plateau. Look, here's a tower in the field, and we think these might be the ruins we just pointed out. And from this vantage point, we can see how open the field really is, with only the occasional patch of trees breaking it up. Although it does seem to get more heavily forested near the plateau wall. And we can also partially see where that western path leads, bending south toward the plateau, before possibly heading east again over the hill. So that pretty much covers the region the Hyrule Castle is in, but there's another region just behind it. Unfortunately, it's too far to make out much of anything, besides some rolling hills dotted with trees, and some distant mountains behind them. But we can at least see where that region's tower is, behind and to the right of Hyrule Castle, which we're guessing puts it somewhere around here on the map. Alright, so that covers the north, so let's turn our attention to the northeast, where we can see a smoldering volcano. And you probably don't need me to tell you that this is more than likely Death Mountain, just like nearly every other volcano in the Zelda series. And like with Hyrule Castle, we actually put a peg on it too, revealing that this is its exact location on the map. Now the volcano does look especially menacing this time, with lava pouring down the sides, and it constantly spewing two separate plumes of smoke into the air. And check out those jagged peaks that appear to surround it for quite some distance. And while we're on this shot, we can clearly see the location of two towers. The one just in front is a tower for this same region, and although it appears to be to the left of the volcano from this vantage point, from the perspective of the plateau, it's actually to the right. And based on our measurements, we're pretty sure it'll be found right about here on the map. Now that second tower in the back belongs to the neighboring region to the east, which we get another look at from this angle. And thanks to an in-game peg, we know it's located precisely here on the map. Now generally, Death Mountain is as far north as you can go in most Zelda games, but that doesn't appear to be the case here, as there's not only a ton of room behind it on the map, but we can see the mountains extend even beyond it in-game, so we wouldn't be surprised if there are multiple ways up Death Mountain this time. Now predictably, the terrain gets rougher and more mountainous leading up to the volcano, but before that, we can see Central Hyrule still appears to be mostly fields with the occasional patches of trees. Although, if we keep zooming out, we can see a lake or a small pond closer to the plateau, and you see that nearby ruined building there, with the window? We think that may just be where this scene of the ducks from the trailer took place, since we can see a similar looking structure there also by a lake. 
Now, if we turn our attention a little more eastbound, we can see another tower in the field. And we narrowed it down to belonging to this region somewhere around here. Now, just east of that tower, we can see a mass of clouds mysteriously obscuring part of the mountain. And those clouds seem to be there at all times of day. So what exactly are they hiding? Next up, let's turn our attention eastbound where we can find the Twin Peaks. The same ones that were pointed out before as being based on the original Legend of Zelda. And we actually know their exact location on the map too, since we pegged them as well. Now the E3 trailer actually gives us a close-up look at them. And sure enough, it's a pair of mountains, with a thin gap separating them. But we can now see the mossy ledges cover both, which should act as resting points for Link if he tries to climb it. And speaking of which, did you notice you can see Link doing just that in the E3 trailer? He may be small, but he's right there! See? And we get a better look at those ledges in this scene with Link flying between the two mountains. And we can see that there's actually a path on either side that appears to wrap around to the front side of the mountains. But even more interesting is the fantastic view we have here, because it gives us a rare glimpse of the world from a completely different angle. Look, there's Hyrule Castle, and here's the Temple of Time and a nearby tower. Now, perhaps the most interesting detail here is that we can see what appears to be a river running between the two mountains and out towards central Hyrule. And assuming that river is the same one as in these pictures, it appears to wind a fair way inland, and it might even connect to the lake in the southeast, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Anyways, this clip also reveals the location of three new shrines. There's one far below between the mountains, another to the south, closer to the plateau, and a third to the north. And then we also have the region's tower, which we estimate to be on the map somewhere around here. Now there's yet another region behind those twin peaks, but of course the mountain's blocking the view. However, we may have a few clues as to what lies beyond, because this scene from the trailer appears to be shot from the plateau side of the twin peaks, which we base on the two paths we mentioned earlier, as the higher path is now on the opposite side which means that everything we can see between them here is what lies beyond. Unfortunately, it's not terribly exciting, being more tree-covered fields and a mountain or two just behind it. Now, I don't want to read into it too much, since our viewpoint is so narrow, but we can't see anything beyond those mountains. So, could we be nearing the land's end? And might there just be ocean beyond? It might make sense given the river here. And it does seem like that might be the case based on the view from Mount Hylia, where we can see glimpses to the east and south of what might be ocean. And speaking of that river, it might hint at a little bit more history to the Twin Peaks than might seem at first glance. As in, maybe these peaks weren't always twins. Instead, maybe they were at one point a single mountain. After all, they are of similar heights. So the river that runs between them may have actually formed the very valley that Link's flying through. But this theory does seem to be at odds with the fact that the Twin Peaks stand alone. As in, there's no higher elevation from which the river could have flowed originally. Unless, of course, our wild idea that the regions could change elevations holds water. Yeah, I said it. Anyways, let's continue our world tour, this time to the southeast, where we find a giant lake that almost runs right up to the edge of the plateau. And based on its size, we think there's a good chance this is Lake Halia. And like its appearance in past games, we can see several islands here too. There's also a massive bridge here that allows passage across. And from what we can tell, it appears to be positioned diagonally, from the northwest to the southeast. And we actually pegged this one down on the map too, and it can be found precisely right here. And while we're mapping things, we can see the region's towers nearby. In fact, we can see just how close that tower really is to the bridge in this official artwork. And we can see that reflected on the map too, which we also pegged precisely as being right here. Now, the bridge is a little too far away to see much detail from here, but thankfully, the reveal trailer gives us a close-up look in this scene, with Link riding across it westbound. See? There's a Temple of Time on the plateau again. Now, if we take a look at the artwork again, we can see a river connects to the northern half of the lake, which is possibly the same river that runs between the Twin Peaks, as we speculated earlier. Now, of course, this isn't the first bridge to cross a giant lake in Zelda, as Twilight Princess's Lake Hylia also had one too, called the Great Bridge of Hylia. And in fact, they look remarkably similar, with both bridges featuring similarly shaped giant stone entranceways on either end. So, could they be the same bridge? Now, the bridge in Breath of the Wild is in notably better shape overall. Besides a few missing pillars, it's only suffering from a few cosmetic cracks, as opposed to Twilight Princess's crumbling entranceways. And of course, it's visually more impressive now too, being much longer and now bearing the Hylian Crest, which would make sense as a bridge of Hylia. But it is possible this is all just a coincidence and the two aren't connected at all. But as it turns out, this may not even be the first time we've seen this bridge, or at least one like it, in Breath of the Wild. Because, back when the game was shown off during the Game Awards, you know, back when it was still Zelda Wii U, we pointed out a very similar looking bridge, which was also bookended by nearly identical stone entranceways, and even then noted its striking similarity to the Bridge of Hylia. But even though they are similar, they're not quite identical, 
such as how the actual entrance is now round instead of squarish. So the question is, is this the same bridge, but just updated since we last saw it? Or are they two separate bridges? Or heck, maybe the game's changed so much since then that it doesn't even really matter. It's impossible to say for sure, but there is one piece of evidence that may have some interesting implications. Okay, so do you remember this old map also from the Game Awards? Yeah, it looks quite a bit different than how it does now. But look at this! Do you see that large lake with a thin line running through it? That's exactly what we originally pegged as being Lake Hylia and that same bridge we just saw. Of course, we weren't certain that they were the same bridges then either. But let's take a close look at its shape, because the bridge appears to split the lake in almost the exact same way, with the majority of the water being found on the left side and a smaller but still sizable portion on the other. And look, you can even see the islands represented here too. So it seems like the Lake Hylia portion of the map might still be accurate at least. But what does this mean for the rest of the map? Well, we overlap the old map with a new one using Lake Hylia as a reference point. It doesn't look like much at first. But wait, if you watch our Game Awards analysis, then you might remember that we pegged this area as being Death Mountain. And sure enough, it matches up perfectly with where we know it is now. And then, do you see that cold looking region over here? Yep, that also lines up perfectly with this snowy peak which we'll be talking about soon. And then, we can even see the ocean is exactly where we predicted it, running from the northeast corner to the south. And by the way, the light blue portion might indicate the explorable portion of it. And check this out. Do you see the river here? It matches up perfectly with the central region's western and northern border. It's uncanny! In fact, the similarities apply to the eastern side of that river too, matching up with the border of the eastern region. So this is kind of awesome for a couple of reasons. One, it shows that not every border is completely arbitrary, and actually does follow the outline of rivers at points. And two, it might be able to tell us even more about the world than what we currently know. For instance, do you see the arrow there? Yeah, that marks Link's location in the first scene in the Game Awards footage, which as you might have noticed, overlaps with the eastern region that we know almost nothing about, being the region behind the Twin Peaks. So let's take another quick look at that old footage to see what might be waiting for us there. And thankfully, the developers provided us with an awesome view by walking right up to the cliff edge, showing a vast area surrounded by mountains. And it looks pretty hilly down there too. Now remember, this is taking place on the east side of the world, which will place a plateau somewhere over there. Now back then, the developers even pointed out this mysterious looking tower, which is probably this region's true tower. And since they even put a peg on it, we can see that that tower should be somewhere around here on the final map which thankfully solves another one of our mysteries. Now unfortunately, we don't have time to reanalyze this entire area, so make sure to watch our original analysis for the Game Awards footage for an in-depth look at what can be found here, especially because it seems as relevant as ever now. And besides this area, we think we can figure out what's on the other side of the Lake Halia Bridge too, because that area is much too far away to make out much of note, besides the typical mountains, trees, and fields. Even the close-up from the trailer barely helps since Link starts just in front of the eastern side of the bridge. But in the Game Awards footage, we get to see what might very well have been our first real glimpse of the east side. But how do we know this is the eastern side? Do you remember the tower on the hill just right of the bridge? Well, if we back up the footage, we can see it's in the Game Awards footage too, on the hill, just left of the bridge. And since it's on the left here, that means Link has to be approaching from the east. And in case there was any doubt, when Link turns to the right, we can see the volcano, aka Death Mountain, off in the distance, which would only be possible from the east side. So knowing this, that will place a plateau somewhere over here, just like in the trailer which we're showing again now for comparison. Which means everything we're about to show you should be taking place right around here or thereabouts. Okay, so for reference, here's a bridge and a tower. So now let's back up the Game Awards footage to the farthest point that we know is still in this general area. And that takes us to these two pillars, which one of the commenters in the original video not only said were suspicious, but also said must be near a dungeon, which is as close as we've gotten to knowing where one might be in the final game. Next, we can see a forest lies just beyond the statues, though with a clearing that leads right up to the eastern side of the bridge. But instead of going to the bridge, Link turns and ventures through that same forest he just passed, and encounters some wild horses. So could this be close to the location where Link found a horse in the trailer? We think it might be because of those mountains in the background which are found to the south. And that's everything we can link to this area from the Game Awards footage. Finally, you may have noticed that we can see another tower from across Lake Hylia, and that one belongs to the southeasternmost region, which we pegged as this precise location on the map. Okay, and that covers it for the lake and southeastern area. So let's start turning our attention to the south, where we can see a huge mountain range, spanning from the southeast and wrapping around the plateau to the west. And not only is it big, but it's tall. Like really tall, dwarfing even the tallest peak in the plateau. So what can we tell about this area? Well, not a whole lot, because the entire thing appears to be pretty barren, at least from this distance. But that might be for a good reason, because it also looks to be a desert-like region. I mean, it has a dry orange hue, and seems to lack most any vegetation, which is in stark contrast to the other terrain we've covered so far. 
And something else that sets it apart is how multi-layered it is, at least on the side facing the plateau, because we can see that it features multiple flat sections layered on top of each other leading up the mountain. It almost seems like it was made for climbing, and it seems you might have to do quite a bit of climbing to reach a tower at the top, which we also pegged precisely as being located right here, which accounts for this region. Now interestingly, if we zoom in at the tower's base, we can see some kind of wall. More ruins, maybe? Now, if we turn our attention to the west, we can see, yep, you guessed it, even more of the mountain range. But this time, we can see a second peak that appears to be largely separated from the rest, although it does appear it may be connected to the other one via this. Now, besides its color being closer to the red end of the spectrum, it otherwise appears to share the same desert setting, with one major exception. If we look at the top, we can just barely see some pine trees, which likely means that the climate is entirely different that high up. But there's something else unusual about the peak here, in that, no matter when or where we view it from, it's always obscured by clouds, which is the second time we've seen something like this. So what are those clouds hiding? Maybe the mountain continues even higher than what we can see? Oh, and in case you were wondering where exactly this mountain is, we also precisely pegged it as right here. Now, besides the vast size of these mountains, there doesn't appear to be that much of interest from this side of them. But what about the other side? Well, while we can't speak for the entire mountain range, we can for at least one portion, thanks to this scene of Link running along a sand dune with what appears to be that same mountain range in the background. And we know it has to take place behind them because of this tower right here. Now, I know what you're thinking. Couldn't that be the same tower in the mountains we just pointed out? Nope. That one is quite clearly on top of the mountain, with nothing taller surrounding it, whereas this one is surrounded by mountains on one side. And since this tower can't be seen from the plateau, that means it has to be behind those mountains. Look, we can even see the mysterious clouds from here too. And better yet, we know exactly which region this should be in too. Because there's only one region that shares that mountain range that we haven't yet assigned a tower to, being this one right here. So now that we know where roughly this takes place, let's see what more we can find out here. And obviously, it's all desert! Which might mean that the entire mountain range serves as a gateway to this portion of the world, potentially making the desert a massive area. But hey, Zelda's no stranger to large deserts. We can also see that the backside of that mountain range shares the same layered approach as the other side, once again demonstrating that climbing is likely to be a major part of this region. But as we step back from the mountain, we can see a little more what this area has to offer, including some rocky pillars down here, then sand, lots and lots of sand, culminating with a sand dune that links running across here. But what about what's behind the sand dune? Well, based on this scene, even more sand. Shocker, right? But how do we know this for sure? Because we can see the region's tower in the background right there, confirming that this takes place beyond even the sand dune. And by the way, did you notice a massive rib cage here? Could it maybe belong to the same animal as those massive skulls in the plateau? Now that's everything we can glean about this area from the trailer, but a video on Treehouse Live might reveal even more. In it, we can see Link paragliding through very similar terrain. And then there's a the fact that he actually starts his descent from atop a tower, that itself sits on top of a high ledge. Yep, just like the tower we were talking about before. So if they are in fact the same towers, that means that Link's flight path in that clip takes him somewhere along this path. And assuming this is the same area, we can see that the area farther out from the mountains does appear to be mostly flat sand. Now we should clarify that despite the similarities, we can't be 100% sure this is the same area. Yeah, we're pretty sure, but because the two vantage points are so different, we weren't able to actually match up any of the rocks between the two clips. At any rate, regardless of where exactly it takes place, there are still some interesting things to note here. First up, look, there's water! Yeah, it's not much, but it does show that this region isn't completely dry, just mostly dry. And next to that is what appears to be some kind of tower with something on top. Is that a creature? It doesn't appear to be moving, so it could be a chest or something. Next, we can see that there actually is some plant life here. Granted, not much, but it's something. After that, we can see that the mountain wall here looks just a little bit too straight edged to be entirely natural. Instead, it may have been carved out. Oh, and if we look down below, we can see another shrine. After that, there's a pair of bridges allowing passage over the gulf here. And as Link flies closer, we can see some kind of creature walking around. Now at first, we thought we were viewing it from the front, and that it might be wearing a mask. But if we back up to this angle, we think it's actually facing away, so we can't be sure if it's friendly or foe. Although it does look like that's back may be armored, perhaps hinting at the latter. And it also seems to be carrying some kind of stick. But is it a walking stick or a beating stick? Now, as Link is closer to the shrine, we can see another one of those carved walls. But this one appears to be much taller than the one before. We can also see some kind of scaffolding-like thing right here, as well as a couple of walkways just above. And that pretty much covers everything in this clip, but this scene from the trailer might reveal a bit more. But before we continue, do you see the rock wall there with the three openings? Well, if we go back to the paragliding clip, we can see those same three openings way off in the distance, showing that's where that scene takes place. 
and that scene shows some wooden catwalks, complete with occasional awnings, lining the canyon walls. And for some reason, there's a ladder here that leads down to a platform from the catwalk, though we're not quite sure why, as it doesn't appear to lead anywhere. And with that, we're done covering the mountain range and the desert. So let's now turn our attention to the northwest, where we can first see a lumpy but otherwise pleasant looking mountain, filled with grass, pine trees, and gentle slopes. And there isn't too much more to say about this mountain, except that there's a shrine near the top. Oh, and we can actually peg this mountain's exact location on the map too. But what about this region's tower? Well, this is where things get a bit trickier. Partially because finding good footage is a lot tougher for these final three regions on this side of the world. Plus, I straight up ran out of time. I'm almost out of time to even put this together. So let's knock out all three towers at once. Because from the top of the mountain, we can just barely see the red glow of all three. There, there, and there. And it's a third tower that I really want to talk about anyway because it's next to this extremely iconic mountain that looks as if it had a piece bitten right out of it. Now it's hard to tell much of anything about it from here, but the trailer does provide a close-up, revealing it as a cold, snowy region. You can even see the tracks link left in the snow. Now we're not quite sure where he's heading, though the flags here might indicate that there's a path to follow. And that's about it for this scene, but keep an eye on the wooden structure down here, because it's the exact same wooden structure we can see in this cutscene of the Rising Towers. Look, there's that flag we mentioned before. It's the exact same area. And if we look in the background, we can see what might be a frozen waterfall or a frozen something. Now, if we take another look at that wooden structure down below, we can see that something appears to be moving in both scenes. What is that? Well, another clip might just reveal exactly what it is. A new type of enemy. And between his large size, horn, and big club, he looks pretty menacing. And since this is the only place we've seen them so far, they might be native to this region. And speaking of new creatures, check this out. If we zoom in on the background, we can see what appears to be some kind of giant creature doing something. Maybe picking up a tree by the looks of it. But if we look real close, it kind of looks like a Goron, who, as we mentioned before, can be rather big and do have a penchant for living in mountains. So this might just be our first glimpse of one. And could this be where that Goron city we mentioned earlier is based? And since Gorons do eat rocks, are they the ones responsible for taking the giant chomp out of the mountain? Now, it's this final scene that might give us an idea of the true scope of this mountain, showing Link paragliding down the mountainside for quite some distance. But how do we really know this is the same area? Besides the obvious similarities, I mean. Well, it sure is awfully close to that floating island in the sky right there. Oh right, we haven't mentioned that yet, have we? You see, there's a freaking island just floating around, and it doesn't stay in place. It moves. To where or how far, we have no idea. But what we do know is that every time we've seen it, it's always been near the northwest corner of the world. In fact, we even put a peg on it to see exactly where it is on the map. Or at least where it was at the time. And you can see just how close to that mountain it really is. Which we also pegged precisely. So what's the deal with it? Could it have anything to do with Skyloft maybe? Which itself was a floating island? There are a lot of similarities to Skyward Sword after all. But beyond that, how do you even get to it? Well, that's one question we may have an answer for. Because we have a feeling its flight path might just take it by Death Mountain. Which as you probably remember, constantly spews out hot air. Yeah, you know where we're going with this. We think you might be able to use a paraglider to catch a lift from the volcano to reach the island. That would be pretty awesome, don't you think? Okay, I'm seriously running out of time before I have to wrap this up, so let's do a quick speed round of everything I couldn't cover yet. First up is this scene from the trailer. Where on earth does it take place? Well, we can see the black smoke at Death Mountain right there, but it's obscured by a mountain, which means we might be behind it. And this is backed up by the fact that the snowy mountain we just covered looks like it might be on the right side as opposed to the left where it's normally found when viewing it from the plateau. Next up is the fact that there's something weird going on over at Death Mountain. Because if you keep a careful eye on it during the full day video, you can see some sort of creatures going up and down this mountainside at various points in the day. What's going on there? And those creatures must be pretty big if we can see them all the way from back here. Could they perhaps be related to this oddity from the trailer, being this weird skeleton guy skulking along the cliff? Next up, this armor is pretty cool looking, isn't it? It wasn't in the E3 demo, so I just wanted to point it out. And then there's a the fact that in this scene, Link's wearing a different hairstyle. So can you change that yourself in the final game? We really could go on forever with everything this game has to offer. But before we wrap it up, there's still one giant question left, and it's a doozy. And that is, where in the Zelda timeline does Breath of the Wild take place? And this question is so big, in fact, I don't even have time to cover it myself. So I'm going to hand this one off to Derek for now. Catch you guys on the flip side. Alright, leave it to me to handle the lore, or at least try to pin it down, because, like many of our questions, it's impossible to say for sure when exactly Breath of the Wild takes place. I mean, so far we have technology similar to that of Skyward Sword, Koroks, which have roots in Wind Waker, 
and a potential Great Bridge of Elden from Twilight Princess, among other possible connections that all seem to have roots in different branches of the official Zelda timeline. So some people have proposed that maybe Breath of the Wild will finally bring all three branches together in what's been branded as the Convergence Theory. It's an interesting idea and certainly possible in the sense that anything is possible, but it would also be incredibly different from every other Zelda game before it although that does seem to be the running theme of this game. To many, the convergence theory is regarded as the only way that the various elements of all the different timelines could possibly be rectified. However, we don't necessarily think that's the case. Let us explain by going over each point and showing how they can all help narrow down when Breath of the Wild takes place. Okay, so first up is the fact that we know that this is the land of Hyrule, which means Breath of the Wild has to take place after Skyward Sword, since Hyrule didn't exist before that. Now granted, that doesn't help much, since literally every other Zelda game takes place after Skyward Sword, but hey, it's a start. The next piece of information though are the Koroks, which seem to hint at its placement somewhere in the Adult Link timeline. After all, up to this point, Koroks were only ever seen in The Wind Waker, but it immediately becomes tricky thanks to the old man. He states that the plateau was the birthplace of Hyrule, which would seem to indicate that Breath of the Wild has to take place sometime prior to The Wind Waker, before the world was flooded and Hyrule lost beneath the sea. But that's not possible because the prologue of The Wind Waker clearly shows what happens after Adult Link returns to the past. Ganon returned and with the Hero of Time gone, the people prayed to the goddesses who instructed the people to head to the mountains before flooding the world and sealing Ganon and his minions within the flooded castle. There's no way to slot Breath of the Wild into these events. So maybe it takes place afterward, centuries after Spirit Tracks during a time when the Great Sea has receded to what it was before. This idea even seems to be supported thanks to the description for the rock salt item, which references an ancient sea. But the time after Spirit Tracks seems to be unlikely as well. Spirit Tracks took place in New Hyrule, 100 years after the events of Wind Waker and Phantom Hourglass. But that's the thing, this Hyrule is new. Unlike the Hyrule in Breath of the Wild, which appears to be the original, going by the old man's words. Now we could say that the plateau is where Link and Tetra first landed, but New Hyrule was so expansive that they used train tracks to visit the various towns, and there's been no indication of the spirit tracks, or even trains, in Breath of the Wild at all. New Hyrule is also nearly impossible because of the mere presence of famous Hyrule landmarks like the Temple of Time and what seems to be Lake Hylia and Death Mountain. Now granted, it is possible that the people of Hyrule returned to old Hyrule after the sea receded, but it seems highly unlikely. Why would they return to that wasteland after new Hyrule is flourishing? So for all of these reasons, we don't believe that Breath of the Wild takes place in the Adult Link timeline. So what about those Koroks? After all, they've only appeared in The Wind Waker and are explained to be the evolution or at least the subsequent form, of the Kokiri from Ocarina of Time. But here's the thing, just because Wind Waker was the only game so far to feature the Koroks, doesn't mean that they can't appear in the other timelines. After all, we never saw them in Phantom Hourglass or Spirit Tracks, though that's likely because those games took place beyond the Great Sea. Essentially, what we're saying is that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. The Koroks aren't the only ones with limited appearances though. After all, the Kokiri only ever appeared in Ocarina of Time, and in the Child Link timeline of Twilight Princess, there isn't even a hint of them which is pretty odd considering where Ordon Village is located in that game. I mean, it's smack dab on top of where the Kokiri Forest once was. After all, Twilight Princess is supposed to be the same Hyrule as in Ocarina of Time, with some additions of course one of which is the Bridge of Elden, that we think may be featured in Breath of the Wild as well. This could place the events during this timeline, but again, there are complications. For one, the bridge appears to be mostly undamaged, which would indicate that Breath of the Wild takes place before Twilight Princess and after Majora's Mask. Yet, that's not possible. According to Eiji Ayanuma himself, Twilight Princess takes place a little over 100 years after the events of Ocarina of Time, so there's no way for Breath of the Wild to take place between these two games, 
given that the events of Breath of the Wild itself spans 100 years. Now it could be placed after Twilight Princess, but it seems odd that something that was in ruins in that game, being the Bridge of Elden, is evidently in better shape in a game where everything else is in ruins. So because of all of this, we don't think Breath of the Wild takes place in the Child Link timeline either. So that leaves us with the Defeated Hero timeline, an odd creation by Nintendo that posits that a third split was created because Link failed in Ocarina of Time, at least in one of the possibilities. But unlike the other two timelines where Ganon was defeated, there's a massive gap between Ocarina of Time and A Link to the Past. By that, we mean that specific time frames aren't used at all, which gives Nintendo a lot more room to work with. So let's take a closer look. For one, this timeline has never featured the presence of Gorons or Caesars within Hyrule itself. However, these two races did appear in the Oracle games, which took place in the lands of Labrina and Holodrum. If Breath of the Wild took place between Ocarina of Time and A Link to the Past, then it's possible that the Gorons that are said to be featured in this game still lived in Hyrule at this time. Going off that idea, it's not impossible to think that Koroks live in this timeline too. After all, if Ganon succeeded in conquering Hyrule, then he likely destroyed the Kokiri Forest or at least forced the Kokiri to leave. What if the Kokiri once again evolved into the Koroks because of the influence of Ganon in this timeline as well? And since they don't have a home and seem to be spread all throughout Hyrule, it makes sense that they'd give Link seeds to maybe recreate their home. But that's honestly just a guess since there's been no indication yet as to what the seeds do. Now that might explain the Koroks, but what of the Bridge of Elden? Well, we've never seen the bridge in this timeline. In fact, most of the games that do show Hyrule in this timeline don't exactly have the largest areas to explore. Not in the same way as the 3D games at least. It may be a bit of a cheat, but we could see the Bridge of Elden just existing off screen in those cases, or maybe even just lost completely before the events of A Link to the Past. That still leaves the rock salt in its description referencing an ancient sea. But the Great Sea isn't the only ocean that's been featured in The Legend of Zelda. In Skyward Sword, there was an entire section devoted to the Laneru Sand Sea, which used to be an ocean in the ancient past. It's entirely possible that the rock salt is referencing this rather than the Great Sea from the Wind Waker timeline. And this isn't the only ancient reference. Upon defeating a guardian, it's possible for Link to find items called Ancient Screws and Ancient Springs. We've noted the similarities of the technology to Skyward Sword before, so this fits right in there with that. And oh yeah, what were the robots called that helped you in the Laneru province? That's right, Ancient Robots. I'm getting the feeling that this world is really old, aren't you? What this all points to is the possibility that Breath of the Wild takes place sometime after Ocarina of Time in the Defeated Hero timeline. It may even be possible that this Link is the same Link from Ocarina of Time. Though he was defeated, he wasn't killed by Ganon. Instead, the sages came to his rescue to protect him while simultaneously sealing him away for a hundred years. In the meantime, they were somehow able to stop Ganon and seal him away within Hyrule Castle. In fact, we know the sages stopped Ganon at some point thanks to the Link to the Past prologue. However, it doesn't mention Link or even a hero at all. The sages were the ones who saved the day. So could it be possible that this is the event a Link to the Past was referring to? It's impossible to say conclusively since those sages sealed Ganon within the Sacred Realm, not Hyrule Castle. Let's look beyond the sages though and at the Master Sword itself. The trailer for the game reveals that it's in the middle of the woods, just like in A Link to the Past. The other timelines, and even Ocarina of Time, feature Link discovering the sword within Hyrule Castle, the Temple of Time, or the ruins of the Temple of Time in Twilight Princess's case. The Master Sword in Breath of the Wild is dilapidated, chipped, and covered in rust, indicating that it's been centuries since it's been used or perhaps that it was defeated if we follow the idea of this taking place in the possible timeline where Link failed. This would lead the Master Sword to a new resting place, the Lost Woods, which is where it's eventually found in A Link to the Past. And look, the three white flowers behind the Master Sword are reminiscent of the ones found in A Link to the Past, appearing in the same general location. 
We should also note that even in A Link to the Past, the Master Sword doesn't seem to be at its best, as it can be improved by the blacksmiths across Hyrule. But there is one big problem with our theory that this is the same Link from Ocarina of Time. That Link was left-handed. The Link in Breath of the Wild is right-handed. So it's pretty unlikely that this is the same Link. After all, the only canon Link to be right-handed before this point was Skyward Sword Link. So maybe this game takes place sometime after Skyward Sword and before Ocarina of Time. Again, we don't think that's possible. For one, the Koroks shouldn't exist unless they have some kind of biology that allows them to go from Koroks to Kokiri and back again depending on their situation. But we don't see that happening since it was stated that they evolved from the Kokiri, not simply changed forms. There's also the fact that Ocarina of Time is ostensibly Ganon's origin story, where we see him as the thief Ganondorf before using his power to become Ganon. Now granted, we have yet to see anything of Ganon physically within Breath of the Wild. All we know about is the Calamity Ganon, which could be a manifestation of the evil intent of Demise and where the name Ganon comes from. But this feels like an unlikely scenario to us. And what of the old man? A popular theory has put forth the idea that he may be King Daphnis, aka the King of Red Lions, from Wind Waker due to his appearance. There are a lot of visual similarities. They're both old, a tad overweight, have large noses, and white facial hair. But the presence of Daphnis would place Breath of the Wild in the Wind Waker timeline, and while it is possible, we don't think it's the case based on everything we've already said. Besides that, The Legend of Zelda has a history of old men. Along with Daphnis, there's Raru, Sahasrala, and even the old man from the original game. He could be the newest version of this line of guides, or he could be a specific reference. It's something Breath of the Wild is keeping a secret to everybody for now. If it isn't clear by now, the Zelda timeline is a tricky thing. Even with the official order from Nintendo thanks to the Hyrule Historia, there are contradictions and continuity errors everywhere. This is just the gospel. Nintendo has and will do whatever they want before worrying about placing the game anywhere specific. For us though, we still believe that Breath of the Wild will take place within the Defeated Hero timeline, though that's not a guarantee at all. Alright Andre, you want to wrap things up? Sure can Derek. Alright, and that about wraps things up for us here, finally. Now what I would normally say is, as usual, let us know if you missed anything by posting in the comments below. But please, don't. Seriously? This analysis nearly killed me as is. I can't stand to do anymore. But seriously, thank you so much for watching, and make sure to subscribe to us for lots more in Zelda Breath of the Wild and other things gaming as well. Catch you later. Hopefully much later. Bye.